Blank check with Griffin and David. Blank check with Griffin and David. Don't know what to say or to expect. All you need to know is that the name of the show is Blank Check. I used to think that my life was a tragedy, but now I've realized it's a podcast. Ugh. Ugh. It's a podcast. I believe he says in the movie, he says a fucking tragedy or a fucking podcast, right? Okay, like, you, doesn't he say fuck? Maybe. You guys just saw it. I already forget it. <laughs> I used to think no, that no, no, my no, life fine. was a fucking tragedy, but now I realize it's a fucking podcast. <laughs> Hold on, let me just sit like concaved, completely like skinny. falling in on myself. But you know that's the thing that skinny people always sit in the most grotesque ways possible. That's they true. they always sit in a way that looks incredibly uncomfortable. Yes, and then become clown murders. Right, and splays their rib cages, shoulder blades ripping out of their flesh. But they're very funny. Well, and can I say it? Dare I say it? Mm, I don't know. A little bit twisted. A little bit. A twisted. little bit or twisted. <laughs> all right, we're done, right? Welcome That's the episode. to the episode. Yeah, like Thank you all it. for listening. That's, That's all people talk. wanted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this, of course, is Blank Check with Griffin mm. Dave. It's a podcast about filmographies. Directors who are massive successful on their careers or give a series of blank checks, make whatever crazy passion projects they want. Sometimes they laugh. And sometimes they cry, baby. And uh, we somehow backed our way into doing a weird Erstats <laughs> miniseries. I'm, Erstats I'm, miniseries. Erstats, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. decelerating us out of it, though. Yeah, you know what the great irony is? Yeah. We were trying to decelerate already, right? 100%. Which is why we, we skipped. We didn't do Shazam. And it now, I now kind of view that as a regret. Yeah, that's a good movie. It made. Well, we could do like a. I know. We'll do it somewhere I sometime. Know. I don't know. But but like uh, it it was because of scheduling because of how long Burton was and Dumbo was already going to come out four weeks after right, it was released. It, was, it would be padding. Yeah, and we were yeah. like, eh, we're maybe down throttling the DC thing in general. Um, but but here's the thing: here are two things I never could have predicted. Right. If you told me on the outset of this year, mm -hmm. one, you will find more value in Avengers Endgame than Joker. Mm -hmm. Two. You will find more value in Shazam than Joker. Right. Because three, you will find more value in Aquaman than Joker. I guess that's just on Aquaman. The line. I, I'm enough of a James Wan. Fan okay. Okay. Fair enough. That you'll I find more in value that. in Maleficent two, Mistress of Evil but than Joker. Say, sure, sure. But I will say, well, she is the Mistress of Evil. Yeah. Uh, I will say, uh, I, post Infinity War, I felt totally burned out. You, you on the mentioned MCU. it on I've our Patreon about, episodes. Uh -huh. Patreon.com slash blank check. Please subscribe. Please. And so I was like, fucking done. Don't want to see Endgame. I, dreading it. Right. Yeah. And likewise, I was like, Shazam looks like diarrhea. Don't know what DC's doing. Mm -hmm. Silly. Don't love Chuck. Right? <laughs> sure. And t the, two of my favorite superhero films in years. Those two. Yeah. I, and I think interesting films that are actually sort of moving the, the subgenre forward a little bit. Shazam in particular, I was very Shazam's astonished great. by the balance of actual dark shit, yeah, not performative dark shit. Yeah. Yeah, but also psychologically, the the we the talked stuff. about it on our Patreon episode yes. about the the scene with his mother and yeah, yeah, all that stuff. I mean, our Patreon episode of uh, Black Panther, I right? Is where we discussed this. So. so we were like, maybe we're done with the DC movies, but I guess we gotta do Joker because Joker seems so weird. Sure. And you and I a year ago, after being completely flummoxed when they announced this film, started to come around to like. You know what? I mean, you know, they cast you know, De Niro, and there were yeah. those location shots of them on the subway, and everyone was, and Marin was in it. Right. And we're like, I don't know. Maybe and, it's good. And we were also like, you know what? I like the idea of making, like, just fucking one movie. Sure. Exa right, right. Which it's is just, actually what DC is basically a thing that Warner Brothers is yeah. planning with these comic book movies going forward. Which I think is smart. And which it's, is smart and is different it from is the Marvel thing. The so, thing that you, know, you have to give Todd out. Phillips all the credit in the world for. All the money in the world. Well, please. Not a single penny. <laughs> Was that the line? Sure. Not a single, nothing. Nothing. Absolutely no nothing. No money That's, in the right. world for you. Yes. That movie is essentially the Mr. Burns joke of like, uh, where he's like, we don't have any, you know, yeah. we don't have anything to spare. And then all the jewels fall on him and he's like, this house is falling apart. It should have been called none of the money in the world. Because that's what he said. Yeah, that's what he How much do you want to pay for your grandson? Uh, about none of the he money He holds up world. an egg. Yeah. One goose egg. 
Um, but no, yes, I think we we were kind of in on the the idea of that. Oh no, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Todd Phelps, to his credit, mm-hmm. says now, and who knows if this is retroactive mythologizing, but this matches with the stories I had heard. He was feeling very frustrated by the lack of impact that War Dogs made. Oh, oh no, I'm so sorry, Todd. Maybe you don't make shitty movies. I agree, and we'll get to that later. <laughs> okay. For the rest of this episode, we sure. will get to that. Uh, but he was like, it's fucking all this superhero shit. Mm-hmm. How do we use, like, how how do I work within the system? Because, of course, comedy had been canceled. They couldn't make comedy movies anymore. Oh, yeah. Griffin pointed that out uh, at the before the movie well, started. Well, the film begins, of course, with the mass execution of all comedians. Comedians get executed. In the town square. And also they take. <laughs> the guillotines drop. They take also the famous, the masks of drama and comedy. Right, right. And they rip them apart and right. they smash the comedy Comedy's ones of the Comedy's down ground. and then it's only drama. Right. And they're holding it up and they go, this is all you can make! <laughs> And the Golden Globes, of course, they they pretend to have the two, but then it's a massacre. We knew all the comedians are are just led off to slaughter. We should have seen it coming. I mean, this is how this is why they gave the award to The Martian because they're trying to push comedy out. And look, I know we've all space poop. Though. What if we've I've all been, been going along Todd with Phillips it. when he went on the cancel culture rant, and I was like, oh, "What about The Martian?" <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, Todd, most famously successful comedy for the last five years. What are you talking what, about? Is this a comedy at the Globes? Maybe it is. That would be the ultimate joke. I mean, that would be pretty good. You know good. who would love that? Is it this one best comedy yeah. at the Globes? Ricky T, Ricky T, Ricky, Ricky, Ricky T. Oh, God. But comedy is canceled. Uh, it's probably the reason why Joker got so twisted. Because sure. he can't make jokes anymore. Yeah. And the movie calls it out. Mm-hmm. It calls it out. And I sighed very loudly. <sighs> I love that moment when... I love the duality of him being like, I should be able to joke about anything, but everyone in society has been mean to me. Totally. Mm, it's yeah. really huh? really cool. Right. It's yeah. weird. It's almost like there's this correlation between the people who claim that they're being oppressed by society right. because they can't tell the jokes that they want to make about oppressed people. Mm. It's almost like there's something there. There's this great scene in Joker, a film we're going to discuss today, Ricky Tate. where he pushes some boundaries. Yeah. Yeah, here's a great fact. Sometimes he misses. Yeah. Sometimes he misses. All right, that's the end of those jokes. I have to stop making them. They're too easy. This is, I mean, this is a moment I love in Joker is when, spoiler, uh, he complains about the fact that people are so sensitive you can't make jokes about anything and then shoots a man point blank in the face. (laughs) And he's right. We cancel murderers left and right these days. We're always fucking canceling murderers of talk show hosts. You know, it's uncomfortable. We got to talk about it. Spoiler alert for this film, by the way. There's no room for murder in Walt Coulter. Because murder is one of the least woke things there is. It's very unwoke. And that's why Joker's my hero. Yep. Uh, David, what were you going to say? Sorry. Um, I just think I thought it was a great scene when Joker did a podcast with his friend and they ranked the races. <laughs> and how funny they are. Or how tragic they are, maybe. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> I used to think ranking the races was a comedy. Yeah. All right. Now I realize Joker. it's a podcast. All right. Okay, what I was going to say is yeah, Todd Phillips goes to Warner Brothers mm. and goes, what if DC does the one thing that Marvel can't do? Marvel has built this very airtight, interconnected universe. And you've been trying to do the same. And failing. And failing miserably. So let's take advantage of the fact that we failed. Because he's got this overall deal at Warner Brothers. He's one of like four filmmakers who has the golden keys at Warner Brothers. Right? Clint. Yep. Uh, Nolan. Uh, Nolan. Yep. I'd argue Phillips and now maybe Bradley. Beaky, BC. Right. Yeah. You Producer know? Producer of the film Joker. Yes. Mm-hmm. But but they've talked about, you know, as uh, uh, Warner Brothers has become more and more of a corporate culture, mm-hmm. that the only three people they give that level of control to are Phillips, Nolan, and Clint. Um, yeah, sure. Right. Those right, are the right. three. Yeah. So he says, I got an idea. What if you make like a black label series of DC movies? Mm-hmm. You do one-offs. You do things that are completely removed from continuity. Where you sign bigger talent on, you do it more prestige you take big genre swings. Here's my example. I'd love to do the Joker like a 70s Scorsese movie. Right. And they go, here's your blank check. Mm-hmm, pretty much. I mean, I, he, I believe, almost literally in the Vanity Fair cover story yeah. of about Joaquin Phoenix, mm-hmm. uh, says like, you know what? I'll find the quote. Because Please Because it's actually worth it. But basically, I think the movie to cost, um, he, he, he says $55 million. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, 
a chunk of change. It's not a not not Justice League money, but it is you know. very expensive for a drama. It's and expensive it's very for R rated drama. Inexpensive for a comic book movie, which I think was the selling point. Right. Uh, and he says, uh, in pitching the movie to Joaquin Phoenix, mm-hmm. Phillips said, "Think of this as a heist movie." Yes. And Joaquin was like, "What are you talking about? There's like no action in this movie." Yeah. Uh, and he was like, "No, no, no, my friend." Made a little um, joke. Mm. He said, "We're gonna take fifty-five million dollars from uh, Warner Brothers and do whatever we want." And then he was promptly canceled because jokes are illegal. Of also, podcasts are fading. Joaquin, of course, yeah, he's a good citizen. Called the police. He did. And they came and they guillotined Todd Phillips. The citizens arrested. <laughs> And that's why this movie was directed by Todd Phillips, head in a jar. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, but, but yes. I mean, here's the thing about this movie. Uh, I don't like it. I was... Not a fan? Not a fan. Okay. And I, I gotta say, I was a little surprised and frustrated by the ways in which I didn't like it. Okay. Because I was trying not to preload him with expectations, mm-hmm. but I kind of thought I knew how I was going to feel about this thing. Well, so... I think that's fair because this film has been accompanied with a lot of discussion and hype. Mm-hmm. Uh, more than pretty much any movie this year, right? Uh, right up there, certainly. Arguably more than any movie in years. And so first let me talk about myself for a sec because um, I'm very important and yeah, you're trying to cancel me. Oh. Uh, but first, I saw the movie first on like the way – on like wave three of hype. Whereas I feel like you saw it on like wave six or whatever, right? right. Venice is the premiere. The film first premieres wave of reviews. Uh, people, a few of my critic friends saw it. Other yes. critics see it. Uh, the reaction was pretty positive, yeah. but the I would say American critics were more mixed and more like this might be a little dangerous. Uh, right, right, right. Liz is bad for the culture was right. sort of uh, brewing out. Right, there. not are people going to shoot up a theater dangerous, but is this bad for the culture dangerous? So, so that all happens. That's right. all resolved. Then I am at the Toronto Film Festival where uh-huh. Joker will premiere in a couple days. Mm-hmm. I am getting ready to see Pain and Glory, the wonderful Pedro Almodovar. Retired bit, and I'm just. Scrolling through my phone, mm. scrolling away, scrolling, scrolling, and it's scrolling, like, oh, scrolling. The Venice Awards are being announced. Oh, oh and Lucretia Martel, famous comic book <laughs> hater, one of our <laughs> finest living filmmakers, a great, a great filmmaker. She was the jury chair this year, and it's sort of like it's one of those things where you know the winners get invited mm-hmm. to the ceremony, and people are like, well, Joker is there, so perhaps like Joaquin won an award. Sure. You know? And it's sort of like the awards like start winnowing. It's like, oh, no, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Joker didn't win that one. Right. Joker didn't win that one. And then we got to the scenario where it was only Roman Polanski's movie and Joker were left. The exact <laughs> scenario you want to be in. Roman Polanski's movie won the runner up. Joker won the Golden Lion uh, of Venice. The first studio movie to win. We were looking at it in quite a long time. Uh, 1990. Uh, I think, I think it was years. 80. Was it 80? I thought we found one other thing. 80, it was Gloria and... And Atlantic City, right? right Wasn't tied. that the, the duo? They tied 1980, but I thought we found one other one. Oh, oh Michael Collins. Thank right, you. That was the other 96. one. Right, right, right. So, but in, yes, at not that point, festival, I'm like, huh. A festival that rarely awards American films and even more rarely awards studio films. Right. So I'm like, I mean, I start to have it. I'm like, maybe it's good. Like, maybe right. like... I know people are kind of creeped out by it, and I get that, but like, what if it's like really good? And I want to be like, very. I like going 70s on here. Scorsese sure, movies. Like, you know, like, I want to be very clear about something right here. All three of us would love nothing more than to love this movie. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, right? Sure, yeah. We yeah. especially, yeah. Well, no, me especially. No, come on. No, but I think all three of us, for different reasons, have been holding on to this little hope of like, what if it's great? Like, what if it's actually kind of an important work? Yeah, I mean, I love Joaquin. It, and it would be nice so to see those elements come together in mm. a way that crystallizes, like, a movie that speaks to our times. I'm not saying it has some sort of fucking message. But even beyond that. Yeah. Even if it was just an effective thriller, like, with sort of, you know, throwback aesthetics. Don't have to love it, but I could right. have liked it. That's a, there are any number of ways I think any combination of the sure. three of us could I was have been very satisfied by this one. I was at the, the – we had a blankie meetup uh, with fans at the Toronto Film Festival mm-hmm. and it was like the day before I saw Joker and I was very much throwing around the like maybe it's good concept yeah, to right. people. Then I saw Joker at Toronto mm-hmm. and I was like, oh, that was a slog. It's incredibly one note. I was really disappointed with it and I was like, oh, what the fuck? Like I was genuinely surprised at myself for sort of getting you know sort yeah. of swept up in the hype because I was like, oh. No. That's Ugh. that's my thing. I because then, talk about the waves of this thing. Right. Since Toronto and since the Venice win, it has just become this breathless cycle 
of debate largely between people who have not seen this movie. Right? Yeah, no, right. It's just on and on. The worst conversations have been happening between the people who have not seen the movie and the sort of discourse about like, oh, fuck, we're going to put security guards in theaters because there's 100 percent going to be a shooting, which to me, especially after seeing this movie, I think – and we are out of the opening weekend of this film, sure. right? Yeah. No incidents reporting other than you know people vaping in the theater being kicked out. Thank you everyone on Twitter for tagging of me course. in any of those stories. Right. But there have been zero stories of anything happening at a Joker screening that would not have happened at an Olympus Has Fallen screening, right? <laughs> sure. Sure. Or even a Good Boys screening. Yeah. Um, but Joker, I, bad boy. In a certain way, that is true. The original bad boy of comedy. Just pointing that out. Uh, in a certain way, it feels like that was more dangerous. Mm. Was the sort of like – it almost felt like uh, – the news media was trying to will into existence some sort of large calamity connected to this movie. Mm -hmm. um, and I then guess. you watch it know. and it feels kind of like empty, half-hearted provocation. That's how it felt to me. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. Right. So then, right. We see it in Toronto. I feel like the buzz of Toronto was a little more mixed. The movie comes out. The reviews in America are very mixed. It's mm -hmm. certainly not. And then – Two boys, Griffin Newman and David uh, Ben Hosley, not mm -hmm. David Sims. Sure. Have, have we introduced this podcast? We did. We did. We did. Oh, Griffin Newman. Yeah. There's something like Went to see it, uh, you know, one lovely morning. Went to uh, see the Joker. We saw a 1030 a.m. screening. I right? would like to point out we were sitting next to a young man mm -hmm. drinking two Coors Lights, tall boys, Correct. 1030 in the morning. Well, make it very clear it's 1030 in the morning. Mm. Uh, we got that uh, cool, cool matinee pricing. Yep. But uh, we sat there and kind of. Uh, I, I, I truly... Did you see any good trailers? Uh, what do we see? We saw... The Michael G. Bor uh, Michael The Michael G. Borden movie? Yeah. <laughs> Ben's very excited for Just Mercy. I tried to tell him... Uh, it's very okay, unfortunately. Uh, you know, it's sort of regular. Just Mercy sure. is just kind of perfunctory. It's like that guy, really good guy. The movie's like, he's good. And you're like, yes. Mm. <laughs> you walk out and you're like, "What a good guy!" We <laughs> like, I mean, which is fine. We saw the, he is a good guy. The R-rated red band trailer for, for Just Mercy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, no, for what? Unrated, out of control. Um, the, for uh, Zombieland Two, Double Tap. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, which I uh, found very funny. I point out to Ben, it has the um, the Chirons, uh, uh from the director of Venom. Sure, right, right, and right. And the writers of Deadpool. Mm. Because those are the jobs that those they went on to after making right. Zombie. It's not like they were hired to revamp. They, they're the Zombie Land guys. They're the Zombie Land guys. Should say from the writers and directors of Zombie Land. Right. <laughs> and instead, it's like everyone involved in Zombie Land, a movie that is fine. Yeah, it's fine. I saw in theaters. It was like okay. Yeah. Uh, but everyone involved since then has had at least one colossal hit well it almost it should be like from the director of zombie land but also venom or right, right? like it'd be right. but also gangster squad right, <laughs> right. <laughs> like it should be apologizing but you know what i'm saying it's like no i know eisenberg it's, it's, oscar right. nomination yeah. harold's two oscar nominations love him stone uh two nominations one winner three I, three birdman what's the third but the la la land what's the favorite third? Oh, right, of course. Great performance. Three nominations, one win. Yeah. Abigail Breslin, I guess, is the only person. She already had her was Oscar. Was already. She, <laughs> right. right. She was coasting in to Zombieland as the Oscar winner I of the cast. she had the and. It was and Academy Award nominee Abigail Breslin. Oh, right. She doesn't have a win. She has no. the nomination. No, no, no. Right, right. Um, right, and it was like that was like the spec script that got uh, uh, what's, what's their names? Rhett and Wernick, the screenwriters on the map. That was Ruben Fleischer's debut film. <laughs> It was like everyone went I love on. How it set you on this tangent. It's a great tangent. Had this big career, and then I love them just being like, "Hey, you loved uh, Venom and Deadpool." <laughs> <laughs> it is a weird time though to like be sitting in a theater, mm. seeing a, a packed, a, a serious gold, Golden Lion winning Joker movie. Joker movie right. that just opened in nearly a hundred million dollars. Yeah, and the trailer beforehand is boasting mm. its connection to <laughs> Deadpool and Venom. Right. Two other, like, you can't make a movie out of those characters. Sure, two other... That, that material doesn't <laughs> work. Yeah. These are three characters that are ostensibly kind of anti-heroes at best and 
absolute villains at worst, sure. psychopaths at worst, who are not you know they exist to bounce off of people, and totally. instead they all got their own movies, right? Yeah, like three characters where you're like you cannot make a movie in which they not are not standing in juxtaposition. Right. The whole point is they're the opposite side, especially Joker and Venom. They're especially James, Deadpool and Deadpool, but like he's riffing on the series. He's, well, he's riffing. David, can I tell you something? Ben, be just have the have your okay. trigger finger ready. Okay. Okay, like on SNL when like Jenny Slade is saying Frag a lot or whatever, and you got a Richard Pryor's hosting. <laughs> okay, David, I'm ready. Deadpool knows that he's in a movie. <laughs> <laughs> know, what am I supposed to? Do? Cheer, <laughs> cheer. Yeah, great. Rise to your feet and cheer. <laughs> oh boy. No, but it was just oh, one of these things where I was just like. Yeah, I mean, you remember how much we were all clowning on the idea? Like, they're going to make a fucking Gambit movie with Channing Tatum. Yeah. And now I'm like, make literally anything. At this point, you I make guess... Make a fucking Marrow movie. I, I don't know. all of them work. Yeah, sure. Pick right? anyone. I guess any one of them. Because the weird, Maggot? Remember Maggot? Make a Maggot movie. We could do it. We could do it. Do you know... Can I tell you about Maggot? One yeah. of the most old, the most 90s X-Men ever. He was in, like, eight issues. And he might like, have the single... Get this guy out of here. That might be the single weirdest superpower ever. Because there are ones that are sillier, <laughs> right. but they make sense. He's a big boy. He's okay. kind of blue, blue skinned. He's from South Africa for sure. some reason. He's got like white okay. hair. Right? Got white hair. Yeah. He's got a whole look. He's got like red goggles, white hair. He's blue skinned. He's all over the and place. And he's in that post gambit phase where he's like got the long trench coat. Yeah, he's he's not wearing like a uniform. Look. He's wearing like, his, he looks kind of like the crow. Here's his power. He doesn't eat food with his mouth. Mm -mm. He has two metal creatures that look like trilobites maggots. that he calls maggots they, that can eat anything. They come out of his tummy. They come out of his tum tum. His they tummy eat whatever up. they want to eat and then they go back inside his tum tum and like you know give him the food. You know a straight line. <laughs> a very clean understandable superpower. And the X-Men introduced this guy. That's not a guy. superpower though. Like, well, I mean it's a mutant power in that it's sort of like sort of a curse you know like classic. Oh okay. here he is. I guess the idea was the power is like oh the, the maggots. See yeah, him? If there's I a brick do. wall, the maggots could eat through the brick wall. That was that was kind of all he had to offer. Right. And they introduced him as like, get ready. The next X-Man is here. Maggot! Like, you know, they were like rolling yeah. out the red carpet for Maggot. Like, there's So let's make a Maggot movie. Sure. Todd Phillips, get him on the horn. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, unfortunately, Marvel doesn't have a black label. Marvel doesn't have a black label. Oh, yeah. Isn't he this also like... um. AMC presents like it's like being it's like the AMC Artisan. fine art. Yes. <laughs> the movie's making a gajillion dollars. Yeah, AMC Artisan <laughs> is now any movie with a budget under a hundred million dollars. That's what's crazy, right? Ostensibly, yeah, right. any movie that just is like not in a cinematic universe. It right. can be a comic book movie. <laughs> but I, I feel like AMC Artisan was slapped on almost every trailer we saw today. It might have been on the fucking Zombie Land two right. trailer. <laughs> it was on. Everything. Um, uh, Phillips apparently actually was like, we should come up with a different name. Oh, like, really? We should have like a fucking studio imprint oh. and call it like DC Black Label or DC well, Vertigo or like, whatever. Like Marvel Knights or whatever. Like right. all those. Yeah, right. right, right, right. Um, and it doesn't have the DC logo? I forget. It does? It does not. No. No, no it just has the great uh, 70s Warner logo. Right. The red. And, I love and your logo. big question you had. It's cool. Since you saw it. Oh, it doesn't have the golden lion imprint. It does imprint. not have the Fuck golden that. lion imprint. Fuck that bullshit. Sorry. Sorry. So mad. It's such bullshit. Usually whatever film wins the golden lion has like I'll show a you. title card before the movie where it says like winner golden lion and the like the festival logo. Yeah. Uh, we usually see that in independent and foreign films that win major uh, prestigious uh, European film awards. They want to getting pictures that. of the Joker. Right. It's a brag, a huge brag. But it was just the idea of, oh man, this is the first studio film to win the Golden Lion in 20 years. How cool would it be? 20 plus years if a movie being released on 3,000 screens opening weekend starts with the Golden Lion brag. Uh, whatever. I feel like The Shape of Water probably didn't either, did it? Or Roma. Did that win the Golden Lion? Mm-hmm. Huh. Yeah. I wonder if it, I guess it probably didn't either. I I guess I put Fuck that. I feel like unless it's for Brag. Yeah. It won the award. Everyone should brag. And they shouldn't be humble about it. If this movie ended with Joker getting the golden lion, maybe it wouldn't kill Robert De Niro. Well in a certain way wasn't that the most twisted thing Joker ever did. Yeah. Was getting the golden lion. 
All right. All right. Um, we we uh, went to see a screening of a different movie last night called Gemini Man, which we will be talking about next week on this very podcast. Yes. Much better. And I said to you. Better than Joker. Do you agree? Uh, yes. Okay. And you asked me if I'd seen Joker yet, and I said no, and I am relishing my final hours of not having an opinion on this movie. It was this thing where, like, honestly, truly, despite being someone who's something of an omnivore and likes to be part of the conversation. Yeah, you were just I like, found it so it's, it's fucking nice exhausting. It's nice to not have to uh, have an opinion. If we were not doing it on this podcast, I would have waited six months for it to end up on fucking HBO Max or whatever. Because mm-hmm. I just was like, you know what? This all just feels like a fucking nightmare. Right. And then to see it and feel like there's not much there there. There isn't much there there. And the the key to this entire movie, which was my big take that I was going to come in with, and then I believe Sam Adams over at Vox beat me no, to uh, it. No, Slate, but yes. At Slate, sorry, uh, was – is that uh, – the, the key to understanding this entire movie mm. is that Todd Phillips' career started – Ben's going to like this. Oh, Ben's oh, ready to oh, jump into this. About. He has seen the film itself. Right. Yeah. Uh, I never wanted to. Seemed awful. It's disgusting. <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. What's the title again? Uh, it's called Hated. Hated. Mm. Uh, a uh, documentary. The, John, Todd Phillips' first feature. Todd Phillips has an NYU student. Gigi Allen, yes. Adored Gigi Allen, booked him to perform at NYU, mm. made a documentary with his participation that was finished after Gigi Allen died. Right. And so it stood as right? this final yeah. kind of testament. Because Gigi there's a quote Allen I want to read. Is like a racist find. punk rock a uh, guy who was really, really on the fringe of that scene, that subculture, and definitely is like, for like example, the best show sort of used him as a comedic foil very often because uh-huh. it his act was so gratuitous, disgusting. He would smash bottles on his head. Right. He, he would poop blood on and poop. stage. Right. Right. He would and shit he was on just, the stage and throw it at the audience. And his idea was he was so punk rock and the. That his shows, the pits were so crazy that you could die if you right. went to his show. Right. It was the ultimate act of provocation. But it also was. And his music was bad. Right. And racist. Right. And but it w- sexist. It was and- all just to stir up anger. Totally. Right. Like, right. That, that, every, every button he was pushing, right. I'm assuming, right. was just to and, get people and, riled. And right. he was a incredibly manic heroin addict. Yes. You know, I mean, yeah, it was he like. Just, he died because he d- had too much heroin. Right. Right. But, like, yeah, mean, he OD'd. Too which, much? which will lead to the quote I'm going to read, but. He was sort of the, like, uh, uh, nihilistic, uh, antagonistic uh, shadow of, like, someone like Daniel Johnson, right? Where it's like, here's this weird outsider artist. Okay. But Daniel Johnson is this sort of, like, sweet, kind of, like, lovable energy I said the shadow version. He, right, no, exactly. I'm right, saying they're, right. they're yeah, the yeah, polar yeah. opposites, right? Sure, sure, right. Sure. Where it's the same kind of thing where it's like, you're going to watch this bizarre thing and try to engage in this thing. Right. And these guys exist in their own weird universes. For sure. And Daniel Johnson is all about craft, right? Yeah. It's all about, like, oh, to most people, this might sound like childish music. But if you actually are listening, his songwriting is, like, incredibly intelligent, right? Yep. His compositions are incredibly intelligent, and you're sure, watching sure, a man sure. let you like into his brain. He was a natural genius. Right. right. right and Gigi right, Allen is like, right. I'm throwing everything at you. My music is ostensibly garbage, right. and I'm just spewing hate. But the, what you're watching is pure unfiltered id in a way, in both cases, that is fascinating to people. And Todd and a lot of other people that sort of, I guess, supported Gigi Allen as they looked at it as performance art. Yes. Correct. I sure. have no opinion on that. I think right. that's a stupid. Sort of a weird line. Why would anyone want to go to a show and potentially get murdered and pooped on? I don't. I mean, the, the Gigi Allens of the world, I guess, were after that. I mean, isn't it a famous story that, like, when they premiered the movie, he was still alive? They, like, shot more after he died. Okay. And, like, at the premiere, he, like, threw a bunch of beer bottles, injured a woman, yeah. and then ran away because the cops were called. Like, he was he was it's stupid. Stu- it was annoying. Well, that, well, but this, also he was like, this is a good movie. But this is also where the Daniel Johnson comparison comes in. I've been thinking about Daniel Johnson a lot because he passed away recently. Sure. It was okay. an artist I loved. Yep. But in both cases, I feel like those guys were erroneously framed as performance art. Yeah. Where they, like, what mm-hmm. Daniel Johnson's That's doing so weird. Yep. Because he is a mentally ill man, right. and he is not concerned with the same sort of trappings of presentation that most of us are, that people were like, I'm not watching him play. I'm thinking about the larger context of 
this quote unquote simple man with his cassette recorder, right? Yeah. Yeah. When really, if you want to take that guy seriously, you can take his music seriously. There is art there, right? Absolutely. And Gigi Allen is like the opposite where it's like, oh, all this shit is performance art. He's making a point. It's like, no, this is a mentally ill man yeah. who is being encouraged because people think there's some sort of meaning in the fact that he is like shitting in a way on stage, that he is causing violence, that there's some sort of statement here. All right. Let's, let's Here's move the quote out of I want to okay, read, though, right. because it's very right, okay. important. Okay. okay? Yeah. This is from the Sam Adams Slate article. And he said, hated ends with Alan's funeral after a fatal heroin overdose. And rather than express sorrow at Alan's death, because Todd Phillips is the narrator of yeah, hated. I know. Okay. Mm-hmm. Phillips. I'm not going to watch that movie. You'd never have to uh, until we do our Todd Phillips. Honestly, answers. David, seriously don't. <laughs> okay, I won't. Because yeah. there's stuff I now have seen that I can never forget. Sure. Phillips mourns that he went out in such a hackneyed rock star manner. It's true. Right here. Right, Quote. Yeah. Personally, Philip says, I always hoped he would go out in a more glorious fashion. On stage suicide, five dead fans, something rock and roll could never ignore. And as Sam Adams says, that sentiment drives dangerously with both Joker itself and the people who have used the occasion of its release to threaten public displays of violence. Right. Todd Phillips once thought murder suicide was a joke. Now he's made a movie about a man who laughs at it. And it kind of is the whole fucking thing, right? Like it's sort of this perfect bookmark of his career. Can we do a brief amount of Todd Phillips' uh, career context since we're in this quarter? Yes, right. Okay? So he makes the Gigi Allen hate documentary, mm-hmm. which gets some attention because Gigi Allen gets attention. He yes. is a topic of Correct. discussion. It's probably one of the uh, many reasons he made it. Much like the Joker of his time. Yes. Then he made Frat House. Right. So he, his follow-up is he makes a documentary about frat house culture, yes. which uh, people loved. It premiered at Slamdance. Yeah, no, it was at Sundance. It was at Sundance, probably. and I believe okay. it won uh, some kind of documentary award. And then there was a lot of controversy over the fact that some of the f- footage in it was staged. Yes, and so documentarians got mad about it, and it wasn't aired on HBO. It was supposed to be, and like, but also, I, I think that many of the people, uh, the subjects of the film, sort of fought against the release of it. I'm sure they did. I, I think there was a mix of both that some of it was staged, and that some of the people caught doing. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, but there, there's like these scenes of hazing that were that Phillips made up, right? Yeah, and like, I mean, he paid people to stage them, and he was like, "Well, Michael Moore does it," and everyone yeah. was like, "Okay." <laughs> I mean, like, not the greatest defense in the world, right? Uh, he also started like an underground New York film festival. Did he? That was him being like, "The real shit isn't being screened," and it was a lot of God, fucking so documentaries on taboo <laughs> subjects, right? I too, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, Frat House leads to him making Road Trip, which is a direct yeah. result of American Pie and the sort of resurgence of the Porky style he met 80s sex comedy. Ivan Reitman, right. friend of the show, <laughs> future guest. Yes. Who, uh, as the director of Animal House and sort of the yeah, progenitor yeah, 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 of that yeah, yeah. genre. And he met him at Sundance when he had the Frat House movie. Right. right. Uh, yes. Montecito Pictures, the Ivan Reitman company, has yes. a first look deal at DreamWorks, and I think they sort of go in the wake of American Pie. Ivan, you should be the guy. Make an American pie. Anoint a new dude. Yeah, Find yeah. a new... But I think it's also just like, make a movie like that. Make a college make, comedy. Um, yeah, exactly. Make a college comedy for us. Because when... It, Ro- at this point, Reitman's out of that. Reitman's like, Dave, six days, seven nights. Yeah, but they're right, like, right, find right. a new guy who's like you, who has the anarchic spirit that you had in the 80s because, when you were producing Animal House like a, and when you were directing Meatballs and all that shit. American Pie came out, I think, July 99. Road Trip is like May 2000. So yes. it's like, you know, I think just the minute it came out, they were like, just... Direct response. Round some people up. Have some teens. Right. There's sex. Who do they like? Tom, Tom Green. Green. Put him in, in the movie. It. Yeah, whatever. And of course, American Pie directed by friend of the podcast, actual friend of the podcast. Chris White. Chris White. Chris White. Who yeah. we've talked about that movie with him both on and off podcast. And the way he talks about it is very fascinating. Where he and his brother had been uh, working screenwriters for a long time, really wanted to direct something. Right. And he was like, I'm very uncomfortable with sexuality. I was very uncomfortable with the idea of directing love scenes. It was not our type of material, but it was like the one – like we'd been fighting so hard to get the chance to make any movie, and that was the thing they offered us. And I feel like if you go back and watch the original American Pie, it is a lot less raunchy than people remember it being. It has like – No, it's – yeah, it's very much – it kind of feels like a lot of those 80s ones where it's like – Kind of not raunchy, and then there it'll be like moments of sort of like it's contained like raunch, right? Like pieces. little set pieces, right? But it's yeah. weird how much of that movie is emotional, 
Yes, it's and sort you're of like a, it's sort of a half sweet movie, right? It's a because weird it's one. the guys who wanted to be making about a boy are right. trying to put as much of that Ro- into Road that movie. Trip is about a, like a douchebag who right. cheats on. Him. I mean, Brecken Mayer, who's like you know, we 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 enjoy Brecken Mayer. He's a sweet faced man, sure. but like he cheats on his girlfriend. But that's a classic example. Has to catch the video before it reaches his. Uh, Girlfriend. That right. is a classic example of that type of comedy casting where it's like cast an eminently likable, sweet faced man right, right. to play a character who is written as a reprehensible douchebag. Um, so that the yeah. audience kind of roots for them because their innate charm yes. overcomes the yeah, actual yeah, yeah, yeah. reading of their We can't talk behavior. too much about this stuff, but exactly. This is all You're right. I mean, Sean, how much do you want to talk about favorite, the Joker? The, well, we can talk about it a little bit, but my favorite thing about Road Trip is that Sean William Scott is in it. Yeah. Is Stifler basically yes, right? Like they don't even. They're like, oh, it's my friend, like Iftler. Like right. I mean, like he's just the same character. And Tom Green had just popped, and yeah. they were like, can we shoot like he one does, week? Yeah, with he just him. does a set, basically. He just does weird monologues. He's like, the guy who doesn't go on the road yeah, trip. Yeah, he just talks to people. He narrates the movie, and most of it, he's just in a room by himself. Uh, and who else is in it? Uh, DJ Qual. His uh, breakout, of course, became our next great movie star. Uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy who played Paula Costanzo. The, the Anamorph. <laughs> is that him? <laughs> and then he was in Joey. I don't know what he's well, been doing he since was, then. He is in uh, Joey's in the Postcats, his best performance. Of course, of course. Uh, so there was Outside that. Cabot. I guess it did well. It did well. It did. Um, and that sets him off. Old school, which I think is the most... Uh, sort of uh, purely functional Todd Phillips movie. That That is the one where, and I've been a little afraid to rewatch Old School in the last couple of years, mm. but I think you got those three guys just at the moment where they're totally honing in on their movie star personas. Mm-hmm. He's sort of reclaimed Vaughn from the post-swingers wilderness. It's the first real strong Will Ferrell movie role, mm-hmm. which then leads into Elf later that fall. And it's like Luke Wilson getting to be like his perfect sort of straight man character, right? Yep. And it's got the right level of like the Todd Phillips anarchy while also feeling like the movie has a soul and not a performative soul. I don't like that movie. Old school. I was a big fan of it. I don't like it. I've not seen it. I've never liked it. I mean, I never, I didn't hate it. I thought Will Ferrell was funny. I'll say this. Like now, I, I, I always thought it was like just okay. I, like, I, I, always, I, I always really liked it. They, yeah. I liked it. I yeah. remember that like, was my favorite of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get like, it. I like get Wedding it. Crashers, which I despise. But I'd now, always be like Old School's the one that for me actually works. There is a scene where than Wedding Crash. Uh, unquestionably yeah. better than there's Wedding mud Crash. wrestling. Yes. and an old man has a heart attack and yes. dies. But they're all like Old Blue. Is that Old Blue? Yeah, but it's like sort of set up where it's like, well, he died with a boner. So I don't know if. All right, look, with that, with that, I want to point out that. No, 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 come on. Ding dong, ding dong. (laughs) Hold on, hold on, let me get it. Okay. Fast, rapido. Why so comfortable? Oh, no. (laughs) Oh, boy. Rickety Joker. Oh, okay. (sighs) And I got to ask you a question today, Benny. He's going to shoot us. Yeah, what's up? Hey, don't ruin my (laughs) punchline. Oh, God. Ben? Yeah. Why? Richard. Rub another man's bed sheets. Uh, to see how soft they are. Exactly. Okay, so he's more of the fun joker that I, I remember so, from yeah. my youth. Yeah. Uh, kind of a composite. <laughs> okay, fine. Um, you spend a third of your life in sheets, Joker. Don't you want him to be insanely comfortable? Yes, I do. Okay, so brooklinen.com, the winner of the best of online betting category in Good House. Mm-hmm. Can you not smoke in here? Has, I'm not smoking. I'm vaping. <laughs> oh, okay. Has served Ask half- me what flavor my vape is. Um, chaos. Dynamite. <laughs> and by the way, I was just kidding. It's not a vape. It's a stick of dynamite. Oh, uh, great. <laughs> um, it was, all right. Okay. It was founded in 2014 by Vicky and Rich Fulop, uh, Two of my husband and wife friends. team who wanted to fund beautiful home essentials that don't cost you an arm and a leg. And because they work directly with manufacturers and directly with customers, there's no middlemen, just a great product and service. It's Way cheaper for the quality. Uh, let me ask you a question about shipping, David. Mm-hmm. Does the product ever come, and I'm pointing at the tattoo on my forehead, damaged? Uh, no, I, I don't think so. Oh, good. Sounds like a good company. You, so you're all the jokers. I just wanted to point out my tattoo on the yeah, composite. Yeah, yeah. Stop damaged. writing, ha, exclamation point, ha, exclamation point on the walls. Sounds like you have a similar sense of humor to me. <laughs> uh, my Brooklyn and sheets are the most comfortable sheets I've ever slept on. Their towels have turned my bathroom into a spa. Turned? I- you mean they've twisted your bathroom into a spa? 
I one could say couldn't recommend them more for my friends, my family, or treating yourself to the upgrade you deserve. We all on this show, we use all Bro- have Brooklyn Brooklyn products. Mm-hmm. I just today woke up and I was sleeping in a set of Brooklyn and sheets, and they were so comfortable and they look good. I got like a cool stripe looking kind. Mm, yes. And I woke up this morning in my Lux Sheets uh, buttery satin finish, and I leaned over to my longtime partner, Harley Quinn, and I said, I just want to remind you that I love you and support you, and this is a healthy relationship. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you sleep on a bed of knives. Well, that's also true. All right. Brooklyn.com is giving an exclusive offer for just our listeners. Get 10% off and free shipping when you use promo code check at brooklyn.com. Brooklyn is so confident in their product that all their sheets, comforters, and towels come with a lifetime warranty. But the only way to get 10% off and free shipping is to use promo code check at brooklinen.com. That's B-R-O-K-L-I-N-E-N.com, promo code check. And if you want to get 0% off, use promo code ha 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 Yeah, good call. Do that. It's a funny joke. All right, get out of here, get Joker. Here. Bye. I'm going to keep talking about you. All right, so, yeah, road trip, okay, old school, okay. Okay, right. And Starsky and Hutch, he makes, like, sort of a big big star studio comedy. America's favorite uh, uh, studio head, Harvey Weinstein, goes, Todd Phillips is the new guy, signs him to a three-picture deal, I believe. They do Starsky and Hutch, which does pretty well. Yeah. Um, I've then, seen it. I don't remember it that well. It's fine. It's, yeah. like, uh, totally whatever, right? right? Then he does, uh, then he did School for Scoundrels, Which correct? is his one big flop. Yeah. Uh, is that Thornton, Billy? It's Thornton and yeah. Heater, John Heater. Billy Bob Thornton has talked about how, like, after Bad Santa, yeah. like, studios are just like, just keep doing this. You're going to play a horn dog. Woodcock. Yeah. Woodcock, this, Bad News Bears. Yes. Like, right, you'll just play, like, the bad right. man. Right, he did his run there. And this was, like, the peak of that and the peak of everyone going, like, how do we fucking make John Heater a movie star? Yeah, God, yeah. And luckily, finally, right. America right. snapped out of that. The one. bottoms fall out on both of them on this movie, and the movie makes like no impression at the box office. And Philip seems a little down now, right? Right, right. His right, Weinstein right, right. deal had kind of crashed, and it was like, wasn't that supposed to be the next big studio comedy director? And he starts going through this crisis. He sets up a movie with Jack Black called Man Witch. Great. That is about a grown slacker, School of Rock-esque man who finds out that he is, in fact, a wizard, gets sent to a Hogwarts-type school. That's what's it. Okay. So the premise okay. was, imagine Jack Black in a high fantasy yeah. school environment, whatever. Ha, 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 ha. Right? So it was like oh, a, the back. A, very, a very broad sort of PG-13 uh-huh. family comedy studio premise, and Jack Black pulled out very late in the game, and Todd Phelps is like, I don't know what I'm fucking doing anymore. I'm waiting around for movie stars. No one's let me make an R-rated comedy, right? right? And he makes the big career decision of his life, which is Vince Vaughn was down. Mm -hmm. Will Ferrell had not been a movie star yet. Well, I guess he He had supporting roles, but that was really his breakout. Oh, you know, old school? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. Right. Uh, I get you now. The cast of Road Trip, I discovered a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I have some history of finding people, making some comedy stars. I want to do that. And I want to make a dirty R-rated movie again. I want to make a movie where there's not the same level of studio interference I've had from the last couple of projects I've made and the ones I've tried and failed to get made. Yeah. So he finds this script, The Hangover. Mm-hmm. And he goes, this is funny. And he goes to Warner Brothers and he says, I want to cast whoever the fuck I want. We've, we've talked about this. Legendary they, co-signs They basically it. like thirded his budget in right. return for – You'll make money on it if it works and it, you get to cast is, who you want. I mean, right. you got to give him credit. It has ended up being one of the smartest career decisions a director has made in modern studio history. Yes. He said, what is the number where if it is under that budget, you will let me cast whoever I want? And they said $27 million. And he went, great. And he picked Bradley Cooper, who had been the best friend or the rival boyfriend in a bunch of movies, but was not a leading man. Right. He picks uh, Ed Helms. Who's sort of the you know 14th guy from The Office. Right. right. And uh, Zach Galifianakis, who we knew was one of the funniest people alive and who I think a lot of people had been like, someday he should one be a movie whispered star. about all comedian guys. And also was a good actor. When he would appear in movies, he was a good actor, but he rarely had large roles. And he makes the movie and it explodes. And because he asked for no money and demanded that kind of control, his director salary was like $10,000 yeah. or $100,000, whatever the fuck it was. And he ended up making like $80 million. It was his George Lucas Star Wars deal. It was a big deal. That's true. But I think it's important to say that Todd Phillips has like a hundred million dollars in the bank. He's Richman. Okay. Yes. He's one of the most. He's a Richman. Financially successful yes. directors. 
So, of course, he does two Hangover sequels to diminishing returns. Although Hangover 2 makes bonkers make, make, amounts make of money. make money, yes. yes. Even three crossed 100. And right. It, you know, but people uh, are kind of going like – People get sick of they went, they went back to me. Do you guys have those steel books? Uh, for the Hangover trilogy? Yeah. I'm waiting for the 4K re-release. Okay. Um, he I, also made Due Date, which you're a fan of. I'm a big fan of, and I will get to that in a second. Uh, <laughs> We're like an hour in. We haven't talked about the Joker. You said I don't want to talk about <laughs> no, it. No, Joe, come on, man. Don't, We're going to talk about the Joker. we got to talk about this movie. We're yeah. going to talk about it, right. okay? But I think the, the Phillips of it all is the most interesting thing about this movie. Yeah. For yeah. better or worse. Yeah, sure. Okay. Let's, yeah, go on, go on, go on, go on. I don't like the Hangover movies. No. I think the first one's really gross. And the thing I think is really gross about it is it's like the worst of both worlds where it's all about depravity, but the whole movie's about like, but actually they're nice guys. Yeah, that's what I, – I, I don't like those movies. Yeah. And then the third one tries to be in on the joke or whatever, but like at that point, Which get is out of here. the one thing I find kind of interesting about it. I like it the most for the, of the three in a franchise I don't like. Yeah. But the first two, it's like, well, they didn't really mean it. They were drunk, whatever, you know? But it's about like fucking having your cake and eating it too. The whole movie is about how can you give everyone the thrill of watching CD behavior but saying actually but they're good guys and they don't remember doing it and they don't know what they It's do. also just not that funny. It's just not that funny. And that's my main problem with that movie. Just not that don't funny. Don't find it funny. Yeah. I, I saw I mean, it in theaters. I was very excited to see it. I didn't laugh. Yeah. Um, okay. Hmm. Due Date is I feel like the only Todd Phillips movie that actually has something to say about the human condition. Mm-hmm. And it is I think a movie kind of about him. And that's a movie about how every single person uh, it lives uh, directly uh, in the the damage or the benefit of the presence of their father or lack thereof. Sure. That everyone is very much defined, especially men, let's say, right? I, sure. I men haven't seen Men in society that. are very much defined by their relationships with their father and trying to – Come out from under the shadow or overcome an abusive father or a negligent father or an overly doting father. And uh, due date is two men with two completely diametric uh, relationships to their fathers who are both completely damaged by them, right. stuck on a road trip while one guy's trying to get back home in time for his son to be delivered. And it's him sort of reckoning with the fact that he had a shitty father and he's a shitty person. He's probably going to be a shitty dad. Hmm. It is a dark movie. But it is one of his only movies, if not his only movie, that I think is actually trying to say something about that darkness rather than just using it as window dressing for fucked up shit. Okay. Okay? Sure. So that's what I kind of like about it. It's Downey Jr. giving his only fucking non-Stark performance. Yes. And I think the most reined in and the most human they've ever come up with a, a Galifianakis movie character yep. uh, in his sort of leading man era. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Right. But he goes from that. He does the Hangover sequels. Mm-hmm. He does War Dogs, which is like, I'm trying to make this step to Scorsese. People kind of shrug it off. And then he takes his big Have you seen War Dogs? Joker. I've watched the first three minutes of War Dogs <laughs> on HBO Go. <laughs> uh-huh. And I fell asleep and I never finished it. It's not very good. It seemed fun. Um, it seemed completely whatever. It's just the characters are awful people. Yeah, it's that, it has that issue, a little bit of the cake and eat it, which is a classic Phillips yeah. issue. Uh, it's got this Jonah Hill performance that's fairly compelling, but he's playing a monster. He's a great actor. Um, everything, I mean, Teller is kind of god awful in it, and yeah. his stuff is bad. And you know, his whole thing of like, you know, I just kind of got sucked into being an arms dealer, it's and like, so un- and you're just like, like, I don't yes, one, I don't believe you. Two, I don't care. Yeah. You know, like, why am I paying any attention to you? Bradley Cooper shows up near the end, much yeah. like in Joy. He's kind of good, and suddenly there's like a little bit of energy. Wait, so you mean Bradley Cooper, producer of Joker? That's right. Yeah. PGA, yeah, and uh, and but like in a, it, it was a shitty movie, and right, yeah. so he's like, oh god, what am I gonna do now? I guess I'll make a gigantic blockbuster Joker movie about murder. Well, and also he can't make comedies anymore because comedies canceled. That's why we all the funny guys stopped that. doing comedy. Yes, I know there's zero funny guys left. <laughs> um, I uh, will say this though, yeah, uh, uh, Dan DeVito locked the gates this week. Well, uh, Mar- Marin. That's where Marin talked about Phillips, right? A, and kind of laid him out. He did a great he fucking He kind of locked run. his gates. M- Mark Marin's got his one scene role in this movie. It's pretty good. Mark Marin hates superhero movies. He's been sure. shitting on him. He right. made it very clear. I took this movie. I wanted to work with Bobby. That was it. Right. I got one scene with De Niro. He's one of my idols. I want to work with him, right? But I don't like superhero movies. I'm kind of like depressed that I'm in one. Well, this That's isn't a it super, it's, it's a comic book movie. That was right? his other justification. Yeah. It's barely one of these. I picked it because of De Niro. We're hopefully trying to do something different. Whatever. I have one scene. Right. 
and the movie comes out, and Todd Phillips goes on the defensive, yeah, as these make- people always seem to do. When they're successful? And have been able to do everything they want. This is the whole thing. Life. I'm like, you're doing great, buddy. You're doing great. Pure blank check If you want to make a comedy right now, you can make it, Todd. His producing you know, you- partner, his shingle at Warner Brothers, is him and Bradley Cooper. Mm-hmm. It's Two of the They're only doing great. four guys at Warner Brothers They're doing great. who have carte blanche are united together. They can do whatever the fuck they want, especially post-Joker. But somehow these people always seem to think that everyone's preventing them because they're saying that they don't like the things they make, which is free speech. All right, look, enough. Our podcast. All right, enough, enough. We're going to talk about Joker now. But enough. Marin, Marin yeah. Yeah, yeah, went yeah. on this incredible run explaining you're allowed to say whatever you want yeah. and people are allowed to respond however you want. And if you feel like you can't be funny while thinking about other people's rights, then you're probably just not that funny. Right. Then you probably aren't that good at comedy or, or you need to work harder. Right. Or the only things you also, find Todd funny Phillips isn't a comedian. are at the expense of other people. Like I have no sympathy for Todd Phillips. doesn't matter. He made the Joker. Yes. Joker. 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 <sighs> when you introduce me, can you call me Joker? Yeah. Okay. So the movie opens with what? Him at the meeting with the social worker? And then, oh, like, it's him you know, with him, the grease paint. Him it doing the right. He works at, so he works at a clown store. And works at a clown. <laughs> yeah, he's like a rent a clown. Clown factory. And they're playing one of eight songs that invoke clowns or smiling or laughing yeah. in the title. I know. Because right, they do send in the clown. clown into Spotify. <laughs> they do smile. <laughs> Yeah. What are the other ones they do? They do everything that's know. like in any way adjacent to like make them laugh probably is in here somewhere. <laughs> uh, sure. You know, whatever. <laughs> but also like in the white room and the fucking Gary Glitter rock and roll part one. The thing about – okay. So there's been you know a, the like 18th sub controversy about yes. Joker is that it features a Gary Glitter song. Gary Glitter is a convicted pedophile. One of Amer- <laughs> uh, America – I'm sorry. One of the world's most uh, notorious yeah. and successful anyway, pedophiles. And so people are like how dare – you know like literally he's going to make some money off sure. of this, which is true. It's Beyond that, true. it's – a terrible use of the song. It's uh, completely unnecessary. Absolutely horrific. It's the hackiest fucking choice yeah. you could make. Yes. It's literally just him dancing on the uh, steps yeah. to, like, you know, to Rock and Roll Part 2, which is just, like, basically, like, clip art guitar riffing, right? You right. know what I mean? It's just, it's, like, generic guitar riffing. Pick when, anything. When it kicks in, I was like, oh, my God, did someone shake the iPhone? <laughs> Why is this playing now? I forgot I even had this on my oh, iTunes. Oh, boy. Anyway. Weird. Weird. So, yes. I mean, here's what's messy about He's a clown. Arthur uh, Fleck. Fleck. Yeah. <laughs> I had to look it up. I had to check. He's a clown. But he's also mentally ill, which means he's not to be trusted. Well, look, this this movie has a lot of nuanced things to say about mental illness, such as if you go off your pills, you'll shoot a talk show host. Right. <laughs> I mean, like, again, one of the 14 sub-controversies, people aren't even getting to it yet, they'll yeah. get to it. This movie is horrible about that stuff. It's, oh. like, absolutely off base on anything relating to this. I would argue that is the element of the movie that— It's the most distressing element. And, and is actually the one that's kind of dangerous. Sure. I, I don't think that, like, fucking, like, you know. Considering that there's, like, it'd be one thing if it's, like, he's crazy and he goes to the asylum. Lots of Hollywood movies have painted sure. with that brush. Sure. But, like, the scenes with the social worker, him going off his meds, like, you know, having it all, well, like, he, he didn't go stack. off the meds. Society oh, yeah, well, took the they meds well, away from You know what? From you're right. Him. Society's the real joker. But also, he is not only a man who suffers from a fucking catacomb of undefined... Mental right. illnesses. Right, the, the laughter is is, is like an, uh, an unnamed mental illness where he laughs when he's, but he's nervous or whatever. he's got 18 medications right, and there's a bunch of right. shit that they never name, that they never point a finger on. Sure. That's just a fucking side effect, right? That's a symptom mm-hmm. of whatever his, his you know, neurological uh, issues are. Right. On top of that, he is also a victim of abuse. Right, right. Right? Mm-hmm. And to me, that is the area in which this movie feels wildly irresponsible, where it's like, I honestly don't think this film is coherent enough or tapped into anything enough to make some fucking Jordan Peterson fan be like, fuck, I got to get my gun and run through the streets right now, right? Sure. sure. I don't think it will rile anyone up to that degree. I, I don't think it is successful enough dramatically to be able to do that. Because that would involve some sort of coherence of viewpoint. It, it doesn't really have a very coherent 
It doesn't. Political. And look, such. even something like the fucking it has sort of it sort of yells things. Right. You know, but, it, you know. it felt to me like Birdman, and that is a movie where every oh, scene Birdman. it makes five observations. <laughs> sure. Have you noticed that this is a thing? Right. Sometimes this happens. Mm-hmm. This is a problem in society. Anyway, moving on. Mm-hmm. It's like all set up with no punchline, right? And um, uh, something like The Matrix is endlessly fascinating because it has encouraged uh, so many of the worst corners of the internet in a wild misreading sure. that could not be further so from what night. it is very clear. Exactly. Mm-hmm. A movie that people complained at the time was overly didactic in a tiny lister right. flipping the cover down on a detonator and going like, we will not let this man define it. Sure, And right, people were right. like, oh, the movie's sermonizing. Uh, laying it on a little thick. Right. And yet, for 10 years, people still took all the wrong lessons and were like, the point of that movie is the Joker well, fucks, that, right? I would say <laughs> that's the reason that I don't really – watching the movie, it's neither here nor there with how people react to totally. it. You never know how people are going to react That's my whole point. You never fucking know how people okay, are going to okay, react. Okay? okay? So but, I don't think the film's coherent enough. Okay, but what do you think? But I do think this movie, in the same way that every time there's a mass shooting mm. – our politicians, our elected officials go, well, it's not a gun problem. It's a mental illness problem. Mm-hmm. And they use the boogeyman of mental illness as just a giant undefined umbrella to say there are crazy people out there. And you don't want crazy people doing crazy things. Mm-hmm. But also we have no infrastructure to help people who suffer from mental illness. I mean illness. that stuff is really irritating. It's like yeah, have the sort of social – like portraying the failure of a social safety net. Right. As part of a fucking comic book villain's origin story. You know, I like – here's the thing. If that's actually what that movie wants to say – Well, sure, but it – no, no, no. Get out of here. But that is a credible movie. If you want to do a movie about someone who is actually failed by society, not someone who feels like they are being shit on by society. But the second you're getting into, oh, the social worker is losing funding so he can't afford his medication anymore. That's a fucking thing. That's an evil in this world. That is a, a tangible thing that people yeah, don't tell stories about. Sure. That's a path you could take. Here's another path. The haves and have-nots, right? Mm-hmm. The idea of Thomas Wayne potentially being someone who has bought himself out of culpability and responsibility for a child is something that has a little meat on the bone potentially. Sure. You know what does not have any meat on the bone? His mom was crazy. She made up lies. Also, she beat him over the head and tied well, to a radio. Also, yes, but also with this movie – is doing is it's not letting anything be true or not true. Like right. you can watch it and be like, well, I think that's in his head and that's real. So who gives a or shit? I think Nothing Wayne matters. is like, well, uh, sounds like you just tapped it to Todd Phillips's viewpoint, which is the whole fucking okay. problem with this movie. But um, beyond that, like it's like, so say there's split the Shyamalan movie, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Which also sort of plays around very wildly with like depictions of mental illness. And I had those problems, but with- it leans in the other way where it's like, this starts out realistic, and then by the end, it's like, this is fantasy comic book shit. Right. Whereas this is starting with fantasy comic book shit, but then being like, but really, like, this is real and gritty and human and personal. Like, right. you know, it's like trying to lean away from uh, the, you know, he's a comic book character. Right. Now, look. I mean, Alan Moore's whole fucking thing about the killing mm-hmm. joke, which he wrote, and this is, you know, somewhat inspired by. It was the first time they gave Joker a like, sort of detailed thought through origin backgrounds, and yes. made him a failed comedian. Right. Yeah. And it was also the first time that someone put a substantial amount of menace into the Joker, who had always been sort of a theatrical threat up until that point. And it was the first time someone well, was like... that's not entirely true. I, I can dispute that. But, but, because he's already... Um, you know, he, he, Joker, we can talk about that, but it was the first... It's a very dark book. He, he shoots paralyzes Batgirl in the spine. Well, he, I think he'd already killed Robin at that point. Yeah, he'd already killed Robin. Okay, at that point. fair yeah. enough. Now, Joker in Batman was originally a very scary villain, yes. and then after a while, DC was like, Batman's recurring villains are not allowed to kill because mm-hmm. then that would prove that Batman is inefficient at stopping crime. Oh, sure. And so Joker, only one-off villains were allowed to kill, and Joker became the sort of more Cesar Romero funny villain. Okay. And for a long, and then he vanished because mm-hmm. DC hated Joker. Mm. And in the seventies, he came back scary. Yeah, seventies when they were then they were like, no, Joker was cool. Let's like relaunch. It's like him. Neil Adams. And yeah, exactly. The, the, the Joker's five way revenge, uh, yeah. which is a great Joker story. Uh-huh. And then yeah, in the eighties, as, as everything in comic books, it escalates. And right. Alan Moore writes the Killing Joke, in which he paralyzes back early, shoots her, he takes na- naked pictures of her. It's terrible. Frank Miller does Dark Knight Returns. Sure. Yeah. Um, but then Alan Moore later was like, I don't like the Killing Joke. 
Yeah. I don't think I had anything to say with it. Like, I, you know, I feel like I should have been reined in. It's just kind of negativity and darkness. And I feel like comic books have only leaned more into that, which I don't like. And then he's like, Joker doesn't represent anything. He's a compa character who is Batman's, like, you know, right. opposite. He doesn't really stand in for anything. Like, that's sort of his fundamental. It's like, it's tough to do something allegorical with Joker because he's not a stand. He's a comic book character. Which I think is what people find so fascinating about him and why we cannot fucking give we love him up him. as we, a character. We want to keep doing the Joker. Because it's like, he, he kind of is just this fucking Rorschach test. Like, he's kind of this reflection of whatever the fuck we're feeling and how much meaning you want to put onto him or lack of meaning thereof. The smartest way that anyone has ever dramatized the Joker is just the the Nolan uh, game of his changing backstory. Wait, I love that. Right? Like, that's perfect. That's the best writing I've ever seen of the Joker in any medium. Right. Aside from the quality of that performance, right. right? It's just that is, like, that's it. That's what we find fascinating about the Joker, is that any one of these backstories on their own... Would make sense for such an indefinable creature of evil, right? But the yeah. fact that they keep on shifting means it's maybe one of these or none of them, or who fucking knows, or maybe it's all a put-on. And then also, what if he put Twisted on his head? Right, well, damaged. Damaged, sorry. Fuck. What if he laid... In the on the floor around a, right. a circle. Of he knots. does that in this movie, right? Uh, yeah, that's in this one in Joker. He does every night before he goes to sleep. He lays out his Brooklyn ends and then carefully arranges knife by knife <laughs> around his head. Does he sleep on the couch or is it like a two bedroom? He sleeps on the couch. He sleeps on the couch, right? Yeah. I was trying to get how squalid his apartment is supposed to be. Yeah. Because initially I was like, wait, did both him and his mom have rooms? And, yeah. It's all right. Also, <laughs> anytime I see squalid New York City apartments, I'm like, that looks fine. Well, I mean, that I've is – I've lived in apartments well, that, that are but worse that's, than that's that. That's the story of New York was the, the homes were often good. You know, they, they yeah. got bad, but, right. you know, good bones, good as, bones. The, as the gentrifiers then hey, said. Good, good bones. bones. <laughs> or as Ben Hosley says all the time about bones. <laughs> uh, bones. Also, uh, Joaquin Phoenix, look at his bones. Ugh. He lost all that Ugh. weight to get all gross. bony. Ben so was gross. actually making that type of he's sound. He's kind of gross. It makes me cringe. Yeah, I know. But you know what's fast? He's done it before, right? There's another movie he's really skinny. The in. Master he's very skinny in. Yeah. 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 And there's another one. He I'm... definitely fluctuates. Yes. Yeah, but I'll say this. Here's a massive difference between Paul Thomas Anderson and Todd Phillips, right? Mm. One of them is they only have two names, and, the other guy and got that's three. it. And they're the same other ones. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> equals. Um, Joaquin's crazy skinny in the master, mm. and mm. he's doing the same sort of weird what you call a ham sandwich performance. For sure, it's a lot of mannerism. This is that too, in my opinion. I and mean, look, I prefer the master. I rewatched the master movie. for the umpteenth time a couple weeks ago. I should rewatch it. I think it's a phenomenal film. Does it have anything to say about the current moment we're living in? I think so. No, I was about to say, like, doesn't it obvious? I feel like it's it's really relevant right now. I think it's one of those movies that's kind yeah. of actually about everything yeah, yeah, in yeah. the way that the Joker is about nothing. Mm, you know? about how society is the biggest Joker of all. So. Uh, um, yes, but, 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 but. Uh, in that movie, he's doing Ham Sandwich. Mm. I think he's supported by the film. 100%. He's, it's a better performance. It's just... That type of I'm not that fond I, of that type of actor. And, and of you, that, his, yes, right, right. and you tend to like. Uh, I love him in like James Gray movies. I love him in um, uh, Sisters Brothers. You loved him in. I, he's really good in that. He's actually funny in that. Signs he's great in. Yeah, you like him when he plays normal guy. I do. I mean, I, I the James Gray movies I would say are probably my like Two Lovers, We On the Night. Those are like probably my yeah. favorite Joaquins. I feel like there's another Joaquin I really like that. Two I, Lovers, he's phenomenal in. He's incredible in Two Lovers, which is like. A sort of quiet ham sandwich. Yeah. Like, you know. I, I, uh, her, he is excellent at. And yeah, I'm not a huge her fan. I don't like that at all. movie. I don't either. It's so, really. It's so but I think he is so good oh, well, in that um, the, You know, uh, you'll never really hear. Well, yeah, I He's wasn't sure if you liked that. that performance as much as I did. Oh, I love that performance. It was my best actor when He's of also very year. dialed into that movie's yes. tone in the right way. I don't know. I really love that performance. He is someone who... I had been pretty sick of him and then yeah. he gave me those. Yeah. He is someone who kind of lives or dies based on the collaborator. You know, because he is a guy who, by all accounts, is so sort of experimental and throwing shit out there mm -hmm. that he needs to work with someone he trusts who guides him the right way and picks the right fucking footage. And this just feels like Todd Phillips was telling him on a day-to-day -day basis to do weird shit and then just compiling two hours of the weirdest shit. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some stuff like that. The dancing yeah, um, is something Phoenix came up with. Totally. He was supposed to, like, laugh or whatever, and he was like, what if I did this dance? And Phillips was like, oh, that's good. And those moments in the movie are something. They're, something. they're not that interesting, but they're at least something. It's interesting we were talking about, like, they feel a little different. Comedia del arte kind of right, reference, right. maybe. Yeah. 
Um, and it's just sort of like something to hold on to in that movie when most of the scenes in the movie I was kind of just like, can we get this over but with? That's like why the use of his body, like he's yeah, all right. twisted and skinny in The Master, right? And it's interesting to watch all the positions he gets into, but it's not fucking like fetishized like it is in this. Yeah. Where it feels like one day on set, because of the lighting, he bent into a position shirtless, and Todd Phelps was like, Oh, you look like a fucking David Cronenberg creature. Yeah, you so look now like a every Bacon other Bacon. scene yeah. is going to have you shirtless, right? In some position that no one. Why is he sitting on the couch with his back fully arched so that his <laughs> rib cage is Joker. This her. man is—he's a Joker. But that's the point. It's all just oh, like that's a good joke. That's a good joke when he does that. Guy's yeah. a frigging clown. Is there one joke in this movie? I guess no. De Niro's got some. No, zingers. the sense one is okay. What's the sense one? I wish my, I hope that my death is worth something about sense. Remember the sense I, joke? I, I, I can't I, remember. De Niro's it. got some zingers. Definitely. I wish got some De Niro had just done like five minutes on like Jimmy Carter or whatever. It is that so, would have been funny. The De Niro casting. <laughs> see him is, do Carson. The obvious thing here is De Niro's cast because of fucking King of Comedy. Yeah, 100%. But it's also funny where it's like, what are the two things that Robert De Niro, one of our greatest screen actors of all time, <laughs> reading cue cards? I, w- I would go even more specific than this, okay? Go ahead, go ahead. Live televised comedy right. and talk show appearances. Right. He is famously the least this articulate t- talk show guest. But this is like top of the heap for him now, right? Yeah. Like this is his best uh, late night talk show appearance ever. Yeah. He at least is, least, you know, he's bringing it. It's funny also, I saw someone tweeting about how like they heard young people in the theater being like, Robert De Niro is like not believable as a talk show host. And it's like, Oh, because now talk show hosts are like, <laughs> shots, uh, Yahtzee. Uh, We're just talking about Fallon. <laughs> but, but also Corden. Yeah, sure. The party game sort of like, right, I'm just right, a good right, guy. Right. I like everything thing. Where it, as talk show hosts used to specifically be, here is an ornery old man who seems to resent all of their guests. <laughs> These fucking kids in the disco. Man, yeah, no, I'm not allowed to say fuck, but who's watching? And you see, like, here's another example of where this movie almost gets at something. Mm-hmm. But doesn't actually – throws in so many conflicting points that it doesn't actually land any sort of view on anything. There's something kind of to the idea of a talk show host using the Joker in the way that like David Letterman used Harvey P. Carr or like Harmony Corinne where they were like, look at these weirdos. I'm going to set them up to do weird shit and sure. act like what a fucking freak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. You know? Right. There's something there. Kind of. But kind it's all of, really just to set almost. up – the final thing. Right, right. totally. It's Which, more just plot. And also, I refuse to believe for a second mm. that Joaquin gets up one time at a stand-up club the entire yeah, movie. Yeah, it goes viral in 1980 Gotham or they whatever. They film like, his set yeah, and send it to... Yeah, no. Why would he put... That's not bad enough to make it onto this guy's show. Yeah, I agree. Right? The I agree. set... Especially not a no. Carson-style show. Maybe like a freaking Carson Daily show. You yeah. know what I mean? That's like every like open mic right. in New York City. Exactly. Every, yeah. right. every <laughs> open <No>. mic... <laughs> uh, here are two points. One, every open mic performance is more embarrassing than that. Right. Two, yep. if someone got up on stage in an alt room in Brooklyn and just laugh for three minutes... Yeah, people would be like, oh, he, who's this guy? This rule. <laughs> it might crush. <laughs> it might crush. I don't mean, like... Come I up feel on stage like with a notebook this thing and you set, can't make it through your jokes would destroy... This thing is they set, get new faces. This thing is set in 1980? <laughs> yes. Or whatever? Like, whatever. Like, cringe comedy is not yet a thing. No. That would, it's like Dangerfield is no. going on Carson and being like, Doc, talking about Dr. Vinny Boombots. Like, yes. we're not ready for, like, like uh, feeling awkward and having that be funny. Like, that's not happening yet. No, those kinds of videos... Weren't catching no, on to the mainstream. No, Carson didn't like that shit. In that way. But can I tell you about something, David? Yeah. yeah. Blank Check is brought to you this week by 8 Hours. It's a new platform bringing you hand-picked and exclusive <sighs> videos on film and television. Of Not course. Not videos of the Joker laughing at a stand-up club. No, at 8 Hours, they've curated over 5,000 videos into a free and easy resource for filmmakers and film lovers to learn their craft and get inspired. This isn't the Murray Anderson show. Murray Anderson Live or whatever it was called. This is well curated. It's not some trough. It's uh, partnering with filmmakers and film professors to make unique original videos from their perspectives, uncovering fascinating aspects of technique and film history and what inspires the creative decision-making process, all the choices that go into your favorite movies. For our listeners, concerts of context, I want you to know, in eight hours' first round of videos, writer, director, David Lowry, friend of the podcast. Past and future guest. Coming up soon. Winky winky. 
explains how Michael Mann, friend of the podcast, in his film Heat, friend of the podcast, inspired a scene in Lowry's crime comedy, The Old Man and the Gun. Right. There's a connection between one of our friends and one of the movies we've covered. Um, there's some other things. They've got uh, Professor Noah Eisenberg connecting aspects of Billy Wilder's personal experience to a screwball comedy, Some Like It Hot. Neither of them friends the podcast, but also cinematographer Eric Lynn uh, dis- demonstrating how vintage lenses helped him create a unique look for the 2018 Sundance favorite, Hearts Beat Loud. Cute movie. I watched it on plane. Um, I'm actually currently uh, launching a, a, a series with uh, eight hours. It's going to be uh, about wet stuff. Great. I can just hear that goog fell rolling in the distance. <laughs> we want to do our part to help connect the next generation of filmmakers with the resources they need to cr- express their creativity through visual storytelling. Mm-hmm. Best part? It's all free. So all what free. are you waiting for? Start watching today at 8hours.com. Boom, baby. Okay. So, yes, we were talking about the, the Murray Anderson thing, that whole element of it. It is weird De Niro casting aside from the fact that, you know, it's the inversion of the King of Comedy thing. Yeah. Because he's not very convincing as a loose charisma-based comedian. <laughs> he's not very convincing delivering those jokes. He is not very convincing of, like, the p- you know rhythms what? of the pattern. I agree with that, but you know what? He is compelling. <laughs> Because he's he Robert De Niro. He is. So when he's like hosting a late night show, I'm like, I'd watch this. He is innately compelling. And I will say this. I think when you get into that final sort of showdown between him and Joaquin and it's actually just an interview, mm. I think he plays that very well. Well, good actor. He's a good actor. But I'm saying you could have made him more of like a Morton Downey Jr., mm-hmm. made him a more like aggro sort of conversation-based talk show host. Or even like – um. You know, who's the guy who used to go after Carson who was basically um, – Tom Snyder. Yeah, Tom Snyder. Right. The idea of making him like a fucking Borscht Belty, like one-liner guy. But they need it for their stupid, the you know, plot set up where he is actually like Tosh.0. <laughs> right. And it, and they need it to be De Niro because do you get it, King of Comedy. Yeah, yeah. Now, here's the other thing. I, I was thinking about the sort of the Scorsese, Robert delusional movies, right? And I came up with that the other day. Tracy coined Carter. it TMTM. Right, right. Uh, but but the taxi driver, king of comedy, sort of like here are these sort of delusional loners who live in their own kind of weird fantasy world yep. with their sense of I'm the hero of my own narrative. I'm just sort of barreling towards this ultimate success and the validation I believe I deserve. Right. And how many people vainly try to emulate those movies? And the other one I think of that was also a Warner Brothers film 10 years ago is Observe and Report. Mm. which was like, you know, there are other examples before that and after that, but I remember at the time that one was so that big. Got so much Taxi Driver uh, right. comparison. yeah. And Rogan was saying it in the press yeah. and uh, Jody what Hill. Jody Hill was yeah. saying it in the press and everyone was like, we're trying to make that kind of morally ambiguous, anti-hero, delusional. Everyone always talks about those movies used to be so morally ambiguous. Everything's cut and dry. We want to make them morally ambiguous. And every time someone tries to do it, you're like, they don't have their hand on the dial in the same way Scorsese did. It was an unfair comparison, but it maybe speaks to why this type of movie, which is so difficult to pull off, should only be pulled off by, you know, one of the greatest filmmakers of all time. Yeah, I mean. Like maybe it's an advanced ropes course that everyone can't jump. But watching this movie, another thing hit me, which is that Scorsese has a pretty deep, innate sense of empathy. Yeah. And the thing with those movies is they are not glamorizing these guys. They are not making them underdog heroes. But they also aren't just beating up on these dudes. Sure. And Jody Hill I mean, likes making fun of delusional people. And Todd Phillips likes making fun of shitty behavior. And this movie feels like – So you're not an Observant Report fan. I like it okay. It's okay. In I my think memory, it has I only stuff in it that I find interesting. I don't think it's a very good movie, but I think it's very interesting elements. Now, to your point – It was also just sort of like at the time it was like Seth Rogen was playing mostly sweethearts and it was – It was it felt exciting very to see much, someone – Well, also it just felt like him being like, you know, like yeah. I want to make something that's going to kind of freak you out. It was nice out. to see a movie star trying yeah. to push yeah. boundaries and sometimes right. they miss. Right. Uh, to your point, uh, think of the, the comedy set in King of Comedy. Right. That is really good writing. It's really subversive yes. comedy. Yeah. He he makes a joke where he's like, he's like, uh, he makes a joke about Clifton, New Jersey. And then he's like, oh, we got anyone in the house here? Like anyone would be from Clifton, New Jersey. Like he's just, well, yeah, I guess yeah. I would <laughs> say, yeah. <laughs> but this was a thing I'd be would, like, yeah, close. <laughs> yeah, kind of close. This was the thing I was thinking about watching this movie, which it's like, it is so deftly handled in King of Comedy the level of skill he has as a comedian. Yeah, right, where it's right. like 
he will never make it. But he's not complete. He's not like this, where he's actually like shouldn't even be allowed. He has like, just in enough competency right. that you believe that he thinks he's gonna make right. it, which is the very specific line. And the movie isn't asking you to constantly be like, "What a fucking moron for thinking he can do right, this." Right. That's. I mean, look, and when you so look this at, movie begins. Yeah. I mean, just because this exactly it's like. He's meeting with his psychiatrist. Right. I have a joke book. Yes, when I write a diary, I start writing a joke book. His joke book slash diary. I've told is, you that I want to be a comedian, right? He talks about how he's going to be a comedian. She's like, okay. You know, she opens up his joke book and it's basically just like he's scrawled like murder, murder, death, death. I am a Freudian nightmare, right? Like he's just sort of like, also like he's collaged. Cut, <laughs> yeah, he's right. cut joke headless book. bodies out yeah. of porn magazines. It's, it's like it's the ri- most riddled with misspellings. It's, he's like illiterate. It's the most hacky fucking like you know snl version of like the diary from seven or what right like it's right. just like draw a serial killer di- diary for me right like that you're messaging three things at the same time you're going a this is like the evidence of a psychopath He's after he a, commits a his psycho, crimes sure, right? Right, right b these are bad jokes they aren't funny they're sure. badly constructed this guy doesn't get jokes And C, he's a moron because every time they cut to a sentence in his book, it is so wildly misspelled. Right. He uses the wrong word. You know, always. The other thing I want to point out is – There's a point where he says have like H-A-V-E and it's written as half. Like I have to go do this or whatever. It's like – so he's like – okay, go on. Well, Taxi Driver, which was written by (sighs) Paul Schrader. A good uh, movie that is well written. (laughs) Sure. (laughs) <laughs> yes. Uh, was uh, inspired by the diaries of Arthur Bremer, who was uh-huh. this guy who tried to shoot uh, George Wallace. Right? Uh-huh. Or maybe did successfully shoot. Yeah, he shot him. Um, and like, so you've now filtered this like four times, right? It's like that that genesis of an idea of like, right, the diary of a madman. And like Paul Schrader, right? He was like working as a taxi driver and going crazy and like writing this screenplay in the back of a car and right, like that's sort yeah, of like of the energy that's driving that movie notoriously. And you got three very academic thinkers: yeah, De Niro, yeah, yeah, Scorsese, yeah. and Trader. And here's another big now, element that movie has working for it: those three guys were all actually living with palpable frustration about their careers and what they felt they were destined for. Sure. So and even they also if the lived movie, in the actual 1970s. Right. 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 They knew yeah. that shit. <laughs> right? Um, but, but even if they're exaggerating it to like a violent psychotic degree, right. that movie is funneling the energy of Scorsese, De Niro, and Schrader each going, I know I have the goods. Why isn't letting anyone letting me do the thing I can do? at that point, Schrader. Very right. much so. And so then this we have this. This movie is kind of like a taxi driver prestige. In that it's kind like about a crazy – kind of. But it's – plot-wise, it's more – Taxi driver. Taxi yes, driver because right. it's about a guy who eventually commits this act of violence. He's and under like the He's kind of regarded as a hero he in a weird way. Up. Everyone right. keeps on fucking him over. Right. And and he's got this diary, which Taxi yeah. Driver has this diary – you know, like this diary concept where he's talking yeah. in his head and all that. And this is just such a like – such a like – boulderized version of that mm-hmm. and um it's uh it's not very profound it's, it's also, a bad movie it's also that thing when like people say like why uh, don't they make movies like that anymore right it falls under uh lindsay ellis who is a a, a film critic and thinker is very good on youtube posted a video that i think is great that's such a good counter to the argument where people say like you couldn't make blazing saddles today like you'd never get away with it because of pc wokeness and her whole retort to that is Blazing Styles maybe my favorite comedy of all time, uh, a film that she loves as well. She says, you couldn't make Blazing Styles today because there's no reason to make Blazing Styles today. Blazing Styles is a product of the time it was made. You know, it was based out of a righteous feeling that was existing underneath the surface of society. Its transgressions were interesting because they had never – those lines had never been crossed before. Right. There was no reason to make it today. It would be regressive. What you could do is make the film that is the equivalent for our times – as no. Blazing Saddle was. No, no, you have to make Taxi Driver again. That's the fucking and then they problem. Did it. No, but, is that people go, okay. oh, I want to make a movie like Taxi Driver again, and rather than go, okay, let's like adjust the compass and figure out what Taxi Driver is for 2019. Well, they did. And they Kinda. decided that it was Joker because now we make comic book movies. Right. So that's what they did. That's what he did. That, right? That's right. like, he, like, he's like, there's another line in that Vanny Fair profile where he's like, if I can't make comedies, I'm going to yeah. make something like that. You know, like where he's like, a, fuck you. There's a lot of fuck you energy. It's about know? the weird fucking energy of 
straight white men online feeling like they're the well, that's what everyone class. was picking up on it you know as it as it right right started to gain steam not so much that this is a movie about a guy who's like looks at the camera and is like incels march you know like sure. but it's just more that it has this it's a very taxi driver subplot yeah in which he likes his neighbor down the road uh, down the hall played by sizey beats yeah and they have this relationship that i immediately was like this is in his head and then later in the movie it's basically revealed like yeah he that was in his head right he was talking to nobody you go either this is in his head or this is the single worst film ever made (laughs) right this is uh, an inept piece of characterization even by the standards of this movie right Right. but it's not it's in his head it's the civil civil Shepherd thing again, basically, like, again, a sort of boulderized version of it, but right, go, from what, Taxi what Driver. What the fuck does any of this mean? I don't know. He's the joke. He's the clown prince of crime. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. This guy puts makeup on a fish. So it's like. You know what I'm saying, though? Not what does it mean in terms of, like, how do I read this? I mean, like, what does it mean in terms of, like, does any of this matter? Is any of this of any consequence in this movie? Oh, like the Zazie Beats stuff or whatever? We're spending this much time on multiple dates with Zazie Beats where I'm like, you on a scene-by-scene basis are doing nothing to convince me that this could actually be happening. No, that's the – So I'm watching it's it the going, problem. you're going to fucking pull the rug on so these scenes are a waste the guy of time. Is, you're right. As you've been pointing out sort of various ways, like, yeah, the guy is too much of a sort of weirdo, sort of idiot. He cannot even do to, an impression to, he's not of a, a normal person. human being in any way. Right. So like, it's impossible to imagine. A thought it, right? I had is it's revealed that – uh, his mother and her boyfriends would beat him. Like he was a yes. kid who was abused. Right. And then what does he do kind of right after finding out information? He breaks into his girlfriend's apartment right. and terrifies her and her right. daughter. And that scene, doesn't make sense. So in this, a scene yes. that also they kind of like leave dangling and you don't quite know what happened after that. Like, did he kill her? Did he just run away? It's, it, right, it's already a movie where you have like the fucking weird. And got, there's going to be 50 fucking posts on the internet that yeah. are like, Definitive evidence that he kills her in that scene, right. or, or that which she is, lived, which and that become, she kills him. But I yeah. love stuff the rest like of the that. movies. His death dream, David. Or don't you what? love That's stuff like that? Theories. Like, remember when Joker and the Batman met? Mm-hmm. Did you love that? Yeah. Sure. What you like it's about great. it? What's your favorite part? I don't know. I mean, I love the Joker. He's great. And He's when great he guy. sees a little boy, he's Batman, Bruce. Tiny oh, 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 we're talking about this movie. Okay, okay. All right. So look, look. Because this is the Look, thing. This I is love the thing I actually have to talk about. This is the thing that we all have to talk about. There's almost something here. Oh, I don't know about that. But look, so I'm watching the movie. I'm watching this movie. I'm watching this movie. Yeah. And I know that Thomas Wayne is it played in it, played by Brett Cullen, which I thought was hilarious because he's in The Dark Knight Rises as a different character. Yes. <laughs> and like, really, you couldn't cast a slightly wider net, but he whatever. Plays, he's he's, he's the, the fucking congressman right, that, right, right, uh, that right. the Catwoman kidnaps. Right, of course. Yes. Um, I knew he was one of the suits. He, yeah. Yeah. And so he's playing Thomas Wayne and like. It turns out Joker's mother was worked for the Wayne family and believed Thomas was Joker's father. He maybe she made letter. that up or right. maybe it's true. Who yeah. knows? The Joker's crazy. Uh, and that's why he's fixated on. And you, there's a scene with little Bruce Wayne played by some little boy. Mm-hmm. And you're like, oh, it's Bruce Wayne. He does magic tricks. And he'll he be the Batman. His fingers in the little boy's mouth. <laughs> weird. <laughs> and the security guard's mad at him. I mean, Joker's like, I was just trying to. And I'm like, is the movie supposed to make me feel sympathetic for I Joker? I thought that guy was supposed to be Alfred. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. That which, was my take. Which too. I thought was kind of. Well, I'll, I'll get to this. But Bad job by Alfred. Yes. Don't let him near the gates. But I understand the entire point of the movie is this guy's fucking weird and twisted. But when he put his fingers in the kid's mouth, I was like, that, this is bad. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> no good. Don't um, put two fingers in <laughs> <laughs> and at this Small point, you know, mouth. this movie has had this progression of terrible events happen to the yes. Joker. I'm just going to take us through the plot. Very That's briefly, where it actually. just feels like cool. fucking. No, but I, we need to, you know, so like there's the yeah. early, he's beaten up on the street by a bunch of kids. Who are not white. That's true. Because most of the people of color in this film are either clerks. They're either angelic or service uh, workers. Uh, nameless. Or hooligans criminals. who are later referred to as savages. But then... There's, I mean, then Joker gets a gun and it goes off in one of the better scenes in the movie. The a hospital. scene with, with the when, yeah, no, that's, no, that's just weird. I no, when that. he has the gun and he, it goes, he fires oh, it and it goes sure. off. That's a scene that's loaded with some actual tension. Yeah. That feels like 
He's it's, watching the musical on TV. Yeah, and yeah, it feels yeah. like it's about a person who would, you know, be sort of on their way to committing acts of violence. Not the most interesting thing in the world, but at least like a small scene that has tension. Like, I was hoping that he was going to go, are you laughing at me? Are you laughing at me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then he's harassed by... Wall Street Bros on the subway. One of whom played by the great Ben Warhite. Sure, who, great who, New York comedian. Who, yeah. who sing Sondheim at him? Well, they're huge Sondheads, and he shoots them. They're coming straight from a performance of "Merrily We Roll Along." <laughs> you got that in the subtext, right? I they're believe like, it. Sondheim. He's, Sondheim. It's a little night music. They I believe. Like he's singing "Send the Clowns." I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, I know that a little night music is "Send the Clowns." I'm saying they know the whole body right, of they're, work. They're, they're David. into all of it, right? They, they, go they deep. just saw passion. Yeah. No. Um. So these, it's a, it's the Bernie gets. It's the the most obvious, like you know, '80s parallel, right? It's the sure. Bernie gets subway shooting where Bernie gets was this sort of unhinged, whatever. Mm-hmm. I couldn't take it any more guy who shot some kids who were hassling him on a subway yes. in a very racialized crime, uh-huh. but he became a weird sort of folk hero to yeah. certain, you know, whatever. it's a very, it's a part of New York's history that is loaded with all kinds of uh-huh. tension. Todd Phillips sort of takes the basic imagery and puts in Wall Street Pro singing Sondheim, kind of robs it of any kind of meaning, mm-hmm. but whatever. That's the Joker's first big well, crime. Well, because I think he's trying to marry that to a thing yeah, that Yeah, the he whole underst- violence against the rich, you know. Eat the rich. It, yeah. It's sort of 10 years too late uh, Occupy Wall Street shit where it's like – but this so is something that vague. could radicalize a city, right? Um, yeah. So vague. and But yes, yes, then it starts to radicalize the city and there's a, a mass joker on the loose and everyone's right. got that And there's almost something interesting to the fact that they are Wayne employees. Right. And then, dealing and with the He keeps coming back to Wayne, which right. is just like the big He's also running for mayor the, and he's running in this Bloomberg he's Trump-esque running, way where it's like, I actually know how to help everybody. And people are debating whether we need some rich guy coming Businessman thing, problems. but also he's like, whatever. He's going to be hard on crime. Or, right. right. It's sort of also this and they, sort of, you know, at some Giuliani point that or, like his version of deplorables was calling people clowns, which got everyone upset. I didn't even remember that. Okay. They say but that yes. in the script that he was like these clowns on the street. And that became the deplorables, which right, his okay, opponents so that's have why been they, weaponizing. Okay. So then you've got like, <sighs> you know, you got like the scene he that he takes the gun out of the children's hospital. <laughs> I mean, kind of a good gag. Funny five comedy. <laughs> what points. kind of a clown has a gun? I thought that was kind of a funny line. Gets fired from his clown job. Yeah, uh, his money. You know, the, 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 has he's the, a clown for hire. In this movie is loaded with like comedy seller guys. It's yeah. like Gary Goldman is in it. Yeah, yeah. Sam Morell. Sam Morell is in it. Um, I'm forget Greer Garson. Makes Not Greer sense. Garson. Greer. I'm forgetting his last name. Greer Barnes. Yeah. Who's one of the other clown employees? Yeah. yeah right, right, right. Yeah. It makes anyway. sense if he's pulling from Marin and comedy. Totally. Yeah. Whatever. I mean, I don't know. And, and I even thought that the club looks kind of comedy seller. It does. It, has that it looks very comedy seller. Yeah. And he does the bad side of the club. Gets made fun of by Murray Franklin on TV. Yeah, yeah. This is all. Zazie Beetz loves it, and it's totally believable. She's a real yes, human. She's one. a real person. And Not she in his loves brain. him. Uh, bad year for Zazie and Lucy in the sky as well. Um, what a talent! But I mean, this movie's a huge hit, so I mean, that's good. She is a huge talent. Yeah. And um, and then there's the scene, as you say, where he <laughs> puts his finger in a child's mouth. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Um, this British man his comes. Mom out. gets uh, has a stroke. She's hospitalized. No, but here's the big thing: the British yeah. man comes out. Who may it's may Alfred. It's Alfred. Alfred. Okay. Yeah, right. Sure. And he he goes, look, I'm I'm Arthur Fleck. Yeah, I'm I'm, goes, I'm Thomas Wayne's son, you know. Right. He goes, oh my god, you're Penny Fleck's kid. Right. And there's that sort of like bone chill and like things go cold moment. Right. And then he says, like, you don't know your mother's fucking crazy. Sure, right, right, right. She made up this delusional lie. She was institutionalized. Not only that, you're adopted. He can't be your father. And anytime he learns his information, he's always like, your mom is crazy. And your life is bad. No person like yeah, ha- like empathy. A right. moment like this yeah. is a stranger. You're Everyone's not gonna like, you're ruin fucking... a stranger's life. Right. You're twisted. You're damaged. They should tattoo it on your forehead. Mm. Uh, he goes to the Arkham Asylum. Yeah. Talks to Brian Tyree Henry. Another incredibly I mean, wasted. Pretty good in the scene. Really, well, I mean, really, one really of quick. the best working actors. His mom had a stroke because the cops. Remember, yeah, remember right. the cops. Right, Bill are, Camp and Shale Wiggum it. interrogated right. her right. too uh, hard. Yeah, Bill Camp. And she had a stroke. Right. Yeah. But he goes to Arkham Asylum. He looks at the file, and then Brian Tyree Henry sees something that makes his blood run cold. Right. And he goes like, "You can't see this because the file details all this abuse he suffered as a child." Because Joaquin stuff. steals the file, and he sees that, and not only that, he sees the clear adoption paper. Right? right now, there's almost something in this uh-huh. for me, okay. Sure, sure, and I don't sure, think sure. the movie gets anywhere close to it. But for a second, I went, "Oh fuck, is this what they're trying to do?" Because it is talked about a lot in hacky stand-up routines 
that Batman is kind of this weird Republican fantasy. Sure. That he is an insanely rich man right. who uses his wealth for good, doesn't need the government meddling, yeah. and takes care of the actual crime, which tend to be a lot of crazy people. Right. But I mean, like, it, that's it's that, that kind of commentary, which, is, as you say, happens all the time, is kind yeah. of like, you know, Batman was not initially developed that way because it was like the of 40s course. and like the costume heroes just meant a different. But yes, that's stuff but that comes sort of with a character existing direction. for 80 exactly. years. OK, the character's going to end up taking every possible dimension it possibly could. So here's. But but here's what I want to say. Okay. I'm sorry. I know you have a point you want to make as well. I want to set them up as dueling all points. All right. All right. All right. What do you want to say? The, the latitude this movie potentially has by being a Joker movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. by being black label DC, by being out of continuity, is because Batman is not the hero of the film and is barely in it. Sure. A movie could kind of actually try to grapple with that sliver of Batman's legacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The weird power fantasy and money fantasy of Batman, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And get your government hands off of this guy can take it himself. And the idea that – Someone like Thomas Wayne mm. would have complete impunity to pretty much take advantage of anyone he wants and could probably use the law and money on his side to cover it up in any way he wanted to. Okay. Someone like this could impregnate someone I know, I know what him. you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what you're saying. Okay. Have her institutionalized. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. But what then – well, okay. So now I right. – And I know the movie wants to exist in the gray area, but it also feels like that's just a kind of like – a a red herring to set up. No, actually, he is just the most crazy and abused child of the most crazy and sure, abused they, woman. Right. I mean, well, and again, as we said, it doesn't. It just can't pick a thing. Right. And instead, wants to do this sort of like, look, I don't know what's true and what isn't. Yeah. Which like already Joaquin and Todd have sort of dropped that kind of in a few interviews as well, where they're like, hey, maybe maybe Joker made that up. Okay. Who cares? Fine. Ugh. Yeah. But then yeah, the Joker. We love him. Yeah, can you just call him Joker? In fact, we love when you to, introduce him. We call love him Joker. To see him. Yeah. First, he kills a couple. He kills a couple guys, or just one guy. Yeah. Who visits his apartment? There's that scene. Uh, the bloody murder of the you know the the big oh, big and clown the, guy. The little person stuff is it's just so. I think that's patronizing and, and stupid uh, as well. Yeah. Not not only that. Not, not you saw it at a screening film at a festival. film festival. Sure, sure, sure. We saw it at the AMC Twenty Five, right. and their audience. Lost their fucking They're shit dying. at the fact that the little person could not reach the locks, sure. and they literally started yelling out, "Oh my god, he can't reach the locks because he's a midget." Y yeah, right, right, right. I, that's what I found just kind of. Yeah, so that was a moment where I, I wanted to uh, sink into the depths of hell, mm. where the Joker lives. Where the Joker. Lives. Uh, so there's that right. scene, which is another. This scene, this movie doesn't have a lot of violence, but it has these brief sort of flashes of of violence that mm -hmm. are. Somewhat uh, effective, I guess. It's a slick looking movie. It looks. It has this pretty, in my opinion, really bad score that is incredibly over the top and sort of like doing that whole like, can't you tell this is serious? Yes. Like sort of thing. Um, the, it goes the costuming, the cinematography, and the production good. design in this movie are kind of unimpeached, and also just a lot of great location shooting, which totally. I really appreciate. Just generally, but especially for this kind of a movie. The graffiti on the trains, like capturing that yeah. era of New York. Todd Phillips acquired Scorsese's producers. After right. Although Scorsese is actually not on it, right? Which I think that was probably because he saw where this movie was heading and was like, "I don't want to get tied to a thing that doesn't actually know what it's saying." Maybe I have no idea. I mean, the the, the official excuse was something along the yeah. lines of like, "Oh, he's got too much going on." But he used I a mean, lot of Scorsese, Scorsese who everyone likes to fucking yell about all the fucking time on the fucking internet. Produced the souvenir this year, yeah. like you know, please check champion. out his like world cinema stuff that's on. He uh, produced Margaret Criterion Channel. He goes to bat for other filmmakers a lot, and he is incredibly generous. There's another in great movie he produced this year. Fuck, what is it? I gotta find it now. Gotta find it. Don't you agree that I have yes. to find it? A thing that Martin Scorsese does that I like a lot. Scorchese. The thing that Marty Scorchese does that I like a lot is he knows how much clout he has. Uncut gems. That's the other. Oh, right. So if he is working with a filmmaker who is taking a step up in budget or studio or whatever, he will often negotiate that he gets final cut because right. he knows he they can, will not give the director the final cut. Right, 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 right. And he will just say – for example, Joanna Hogg, give me your cut, and I'll tell A24, this is my cut. Right. Right. Um, and, and I think he doesn't want to 
Check out his A24 podcast of Trojan that Hug, kindness podcast of the year. To films that don't need it. Sure, maybe that was it. I don't know. I mean, he certainly could have put his money, uh, his uh, name, name on this on thing it and made, made a bunch some money. of money. But, um, but, anyway. but Todd Phillips did use a bunch of his team. Sure. And they're the best, especially at working in New York. Right. Yeah. So Joker goes on the talk show. He yeah. shoots Murray Franklin. Look. Shoots him in the eye. Yeah. Bang, bang with a gun. Kind of a striking scene in and of itself. Certainly a disturbing and striking scene in and of itself. You're watching two. Doesn't really have anything to do with anything in this movie. Really, there's sort of I like it. Just didn't feel like the movie had built to this no. in the correct way at all. It feels like but a scene when you're from watching a it, film. it's tense. And I'll say this: it felt like the creepiness of watching something like, um, uh, like, like uh, what's his name, Bud Dwyer. You know, yeah, you know, when, oh God, right, yeah. but, but very that feeling of watching a very creepy, grainy video on YouTube of like you know a TV tape, yeah, it, yeah, right? Right. right. What, what's the, the movies about Christine? Right. right, like those right. things, those weird urban legends. Right. I mean, it, not urban legends, it, but like. Th- those horrible sort of like t- violent acts on TV. And the faces of death. Yes. They're, they're, during this sequence, I went, this is actually bottling something for me that I don't think the film has earned up until this point. I don't think it knows what to do with sure. after it's done. But. That's the slickness, right? It's like, yeah. It'll get it'll get a rise out of you. Right. But watching something very weird about why is this man wearing clown makeup on this talk show, right. watching it from the vantage point of an audience who has no context and isn't watching a Joker movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. and when they cut out to the grid of TV screens, I go, this is kind of an argument for trying to make a quote-unquote gritty Joker movie is how scary would it be if in the real world some guy came on the fucking David Letterman show – and yeah, seemed and like he was him. Tiny right. Tim, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then got weirdly morose, and then shot a guy point blank. Okay, so then what happens after that scene? Yeah, is like a riot breaks out. Mm-hmm. People wearing Joker masks. It sort of gets tied up, as you say, in this kind of like half baked Occupy Wall Street sort of like the poor Anonymous. are rising up against the rich. Yeah, right. And he's already Antifa, become a cult whatever. hero just as because he shot a couple suits in his stuff. And now he's taking credit for it. And there's a name and, and the name and you know. Look, Ricky T. Uh, while this is all going on, a couple of rich guys and their kids decided to go see Zorro at a fucking theater, and then we watch for the millionth time as uh, Thomas and Martha Wayne about? are gunned no, that down. Fir- that was the first in front time. of their son, down to the pearls. You beat me to my joke. Down to the fucking pearls. Why? What's your joke? I was going to say, David, that's true, but they add something to the equation that hasn't been in any of the depictions before, which is the pearls being pulled off. Because it's crazy that everyone feels the need to not only show this fucking scene, but but get the fucking pearl insert as well. But um, it, it happened not in an alleyway in the other movies, right? Yeah, no, right. In the other movies, it happened on an escalator. I mean, oh, yeah, no. Yeah. It's always- <laughs> David, also, massive correction. They don't get killed walking out of a screening of Zorro. They get killed walking out of a screening of Zorro the Gay Blade. Zorro the Gay Blade. The George Hamilton comedy that is, what if Zorro was gay? Where it's 90 minutes of the kind of very subtle, nuanced, thoughtful <laughs> Todd Phillips. gay jokes <laughs> really that only like 1982 could bring that Todd Phillips ostensibly got canceled. Loves the cancel police came for Zara the gay Zara the gay blade and they drove him out. Um, so we see. It's and true. When that, you can't be a gay blade. When anymore. that happened, you can't be a gay now, blade. Did, it's a reason you, all the best okay. gay blades have given up. When that happened, yeah, I had no idea that they were going to do. I neither. I threw my hands up and I looked at them. <laughs> and I went, "Are you fucking kidding me?" So you were not spoiled. I did you, not know you that were was fear. Happen. You you had told me you confessed that you were afraid someone, something had been spoiled. Someone for you. tweeted something about the the Thomas Wayne Joker's mom thing. Uh, oh, I see. No, that's not. I just could not believe when I was watching this movie yeah. that it had been so laboriously like we're not a comic book movie. We're you know this is really a standalone. Then yeah. I'm like, oh, but you had to sh- kill the Wayne family for yeah. the fiftieth time. Yeah, and then like, I guess suggest that like yeah, like you know because like classically yeah. In any Joker origin in the comics, mm-hmm. especially in Killing Joke, yeah, he Batman is tied to his origin. Yes, he's robbing a place, a chemical plant. In both the fifties origin, they kind of gave him, and then the eighties origin, they're more revamped. Uh, Batman's already at large. Batman is there to catch him, and he dives into the chemical plant or falls in a way, mm-hmm. and like turn. And so, like, so that's why that he's always focused on Batman. That's sort of like yeah. the original. And so now, I guess it's just like you know they're tied together in that way, like Batman. Either they're brothers or – Or yeah. – uh, let me ask you this. It's just – it's just – it feels like the movie like having this final like how profound and you're right. just like 
I don't <laughs> think that's anything. Well, here's the thing. I think if they were actually the legitimate and illegitimate son of Thomas Wayne, uh-huh. the movie could make some kind of statement yeah, but it's not, about nature versus nurture. But it's not going to – No, it's not doing I mean it's and it wouldn't really do it with not nuance. doing that. Right. But it wouldn't anyway, do it with nuance. What else were you going to say? Um, what I was going to say is uh, – correct me if I'm wrong. I believe Joaquin Phoenix is 49 years old. Sounds about right. And the boy who plays Batman in this looks about, I don't know, 10? He's 44 years old. Okay. And the boy's 10, sure. The boy is 10. So you're saying like Tom, uh, Bruce Wayne would have, uh, Thomas Wayne would have had to be like 20? Right. Uh, right, something like that. I mean, Batman but, never becomes Batman, right? Bruce Wayne never becomes Batman canonically younger than like early 20s. Sure, right. So even so then, he's going to be chasing around an old Joker. At his absolute <laughs> youngest, the first well, time he puts on the cowl, Joker's 60. Here's something Joaquin Phoenix said. I. I'm sorry to report it because not it's that it annoying. matters because whatever I know, but, but I yeah. do want to actually just tell you that he said this, okay. where he's like, "What if this movie is like, like the Joker of the comics, like sees this and it's his like origin myth, like so it's like this is not about like the comic book Joker, okay? It's about like a guy in clown makeup who does this thing and becomes like a notorious figure, and the other Joker is like drafting off of that or something. I don't know. He said this in an interview, okay." Uh, the final scene is him talking to – that's April Grace, right? Is it? Uh, uh, who I love. Uh, and he's in the uh, Arkham or whatever. Because right, well, the movie ends with they're, they're, the fucking cops have him in the back. Uh, uh, Johnny C. and Tempo. It's April Grace, yeah. Johnny C. and Tempo, one of the best stunt coordinators in the business – Worked on The Tick, but also worked on most of the Fast and Furious movies and is my source for all the Vin Diesel stories I will never tell on Mike. Yeah. Plays the cop who is driving the car yeah. and is like, you fucking freak. Where do you get off? But then some clown in an ambulance crashes into the police car yeah. and they pull his body out and they raise right. him to the rafters and he gets a standing ovation. Right. And I went, OK, you know what? Fine. That's what you want. That's what you want for this movie. He takes his bow. He finally gets his recognition. And then the movie tacks on this extra scene. Yeah. That is really just, annoying scene. Here he is institutionalized. Right. That I've seen a couple of people suggest like, what if that's the only real scene and everything else was in his head? Well, Man. But the, <laughs> so then, OK, then, then great. The movie, I don't know. The movie means less than it already means. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, but he's telling. He said, "Isn't that where he says some of you wouldn't get the joke?" He's laughing and he says, "You wouldn't get the joke." And then you see him running away and he's I'm leaving sorry. bloody footprints. Bef- before he says, "You wouldn't get the joke," it cuts to Bruce in the alley with his dead parents. Oh yeah, right. implying that the thing he is laughing at is right. I mean, the, it's pretty funny. The orphaning of what a, a young funny child. movie. Uh, and then he's got bloody footprints, suggesting that he killed April Grace as well. I guess. And he's dancing, and then they chase him, and. They're... I liked it when there was the old Warner Brothers logo. I did too. That was the high point of the Probably movie for me. The so we all have a good subscription box, right? Yeah. From food boxes to wellness boxes, they're all the rage. Oh boy, I forgot that they're the sponsors on this episode. <laughs> what about a subscription <laughs> box for kids that's fun and educational and helps them develop creative confidence to change the world? This is stuff kids can put in their mouth. This is Kiwi Co. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With supervision and following the guidelines. Of course. Look, our kids. This is Kiwiko. They're friends of the show. Our kids are the future. Yes. It's our job to prepare them for that. Empower them to be creative, confident, and fearless in all their endeavors. Okay? So instead of taking them to go see the Joker, give them some of Kiwiko's innovative products. Let's say this very clearly. Kiwiko is kind of the anti-Joker. It is. It's actually great. Um, it's they- the origin story for your child. Growing up to be a healthy adult. They sent me a koala box. I gave it to my my friend's two year old child. I do not currently have a child. Retired man. Um, uh, and it's all it's like a little doctor. You and Forky are expecting though, right? <laughs> God, what an aberration. A little silver spoon. <laughs> um, and these boxes are super cool, hands on projects for kids to make learning about STEAM fun. You know, STEAM uh, science, technology, engineering, art, and math. It's designed by experts. Te- uh, sorry. Designed by experts and tested by kids. There's no need to research or worry about gathering all the supplies. And there's seven lines to choose from for kids from ages zero to 104. I am always astounded by how many people listen to our show and our parents. But they They are are out there. Of course. They are legion. We'll get videos of people having their kids sing our theme song (laughs) or wearing a Hello Fennel shirt. So if you are a blankie and a parent or – well, And it's – you got friends with kids, yeah, yeah, yeah. nephews, nieces. It's just, you know, it's a box service. Yes. It's a new box every month. Each month you get a new fun, creative, engaging project for kids, right? And they're helping you with something. They're going to teach you some skill. They're going to give your kids some hand-eye right. coordination. They come with supplies. They come with detail, 
easy to follow instructions written for kids. They have a little educational magazine to learn more about the theme. And look, justifiably, people are very protective of what kids are taking and consuming. A lot of parents don't want their kids playing with plastic toys. They don't want playing with branded things. Yeah. KiwiCo is going to really curate a box for you. And you're going to be able to pick the things you want based on the age group, based on your kids' interests. Yeah. And you're going to be able to trust that these are going to be good, productive things to give to a child. You're going to spark a sense of adventure and curiosity. Sure. That's, That's right. exciting. And it's, you know what? Also, this stuff will guarantee that you won't create a Richard T. You're not going to end up with a Ricky T on your hands. So, yeah. That's all a parent could want. Yeah. Let me tell you something. No Ricky T's. KiwiCo is a convenient, affordable way to encourage your children to be anything they want to be. There's no commitment. You can cancel any time. And monthly options start at $16.95 a month, including shipping. So for our listeners, go to KiwiCo.com slash blank to get your first month free. Every day counts when it comes to making a difference. So don't miss out on this amazing opportunity. Again, go to KiwiCo slash blank. KiwiCo.com slash blank and get your first month free. That's KiwiCo.com slash blank. We're talking one box free. If you got any kid in your life, why not send him a box? <laughs> okay. Joker. Joker. You want to do the box office game? No, I mean, I, I was trying to think of a more interesting thing to do. I mean, we're recording this it's very right, right soon after, after. it uh, was released, obviously. I mean, we could try guessing, but I just feel like it's going to be boring. Come on, give me the five. You know what's another thing I realize where I often struggle more with things that came out in the last couple of months than older releases? It's because so much of my box office memory is tied to the time and place of when a movie came out. And mm. when that is indistinguishable from when we're recording, sure. it hasn't made the imprint yet. Yeah, but give me the five. Okay, number one is Joker did 96. 96. Um, More than Justice League. Yeah. Number two. What is it? Would be whatever was number one last weekend. And what was that? And was it number one only for that one weekend? Correct. And it was, we're talking about October. It dethroned Hustlers. Yeah. It was something of. It actually dethroned Downton, I believe. Oh, of course. Which is number three. Downton. Suplexing. And Hustlers is number four. It's been a robust October. It has. It's been quite a robust October. Number five is the a very high grossing in September film, but uh, uh, it chapter two. Yes, um, finishing out September. Did you it. see a chapter two? I did not. Did you see a chapter one? I did. Okay. Here's the thing I decided this year, and I'm trying not to be a grump, but it's just the thing I decided. I am not forcing myself out of obligation to sure. go see the big movies that I know I'm not going to like. Right. So I liked a chapter one just fine. And I heard such roundly negative things about it, Chapter 2, yeah. that I went, I'm going to prioritize seeing smaller things that That's I think wise. I might like. And you I will catch a Chapter 2. I'll watch two it at home sometime. Okay. They don't need my money. I don't need to vote with my dollar for that. I don't think I'd enjoy seeing it that much. But what is number two? Number two. Defeated Downtown. <laughs> this is weird because it's like I've seen marketing for it. And I'm like, huh? this exists? Yeah. It exists. I made little impression. I'm trying to think. In two weeks, it's made $37 million. And I already forget that it exists. Downton Abbey beat Rambo and Ad Astra. Which are uh, Ad Astra is seventh and Rambo right. is eighth here. And this was number one. Ad Astra, uh, unsurprisingly, has a fairly comfortable worldwide total because of Brad Pitt's stardom. Uh, this weirdly might unlock it for me. Can you tell me what this film did? In its first weekend, its number one weekend. I believe it made around $20 million. That's correct. 20.6. 20 on the nug. Mm-hmm. 20 on the nug. Okay. <laughs> Seems like that didn't help. No, it didn't. I <laughs> thought it would. What a generic number one performance. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll tell you that it's a, uh, a children's film. Of course. And I'll tell you that it uh, seems to be uh, sort oh, of oh, abominable. geared towards an international audience. Yes, in ab abominable, abominable. Yes, he's the snowman. Uh, he is. Yep. Uh, you have Rambo. You have. Um, Wait, he's that serial killer? Yes, he's the snowman. He gave him all <laughs> right, the clues. Gave him all the clues. If only Joker had given us some clues. <laughs> Uh, Harry good boys Hall. is still hanging out in the top ten. What's good boys up to? Is it cracked to hundred? Eighty two. Oh wow. Okay. Um, but uh, hundred worldwide, hundred seven. Uh, Lion King, uh, did quite well, but ended up basically it a was the Beauty and the Beast number, number. one high school football. New, uh, mm. new. Give it some time. I think it's gonna get there. Yeah, it's gonna need. Uh, it's gonna need to hang around. Uh, Hobbs and Shaw seems to be done at about one seven three seven fifty eight worldwide. Which we disagree about this. It did very well. Yeah, but it is a big drop from the mainline Fast and Furious entries. Is it? What mm -hmm. did What did Fate make? 
Fate was humongous. Fate, I believe, made $1.2 billion. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. But I think given that, um, you know, if they're trying to launch a second franchise, sure. I guess they're I just, happy about it's it. not like they cut. It's a terrible movie. It's not a great film. It's not like they cut the now, budget a ton. I want to talk these spin-offs, about spin-offs, it's about coming up with a I talk cheaper a movie, satellite. A movie I have not seen. Okay. That made $18 million. Hmm. That's more than uh, The Goldfinch, mm-hmm. right? It's more than uh, The Farewell, great are, movie. Are you talking about the highest grossing independent film of the year? Yes. The Peanut Butter Falcon? The Peanut Butter Falcon. A weird box office phenomenon. That's sort of like, I'm I not guess, feel-good movie. That was at Sundance, but made no impression. Right. So are Shia LaBeouf and Dakota Johnson. Bruce Dern. It, uh, that's right. John it's, Hawks. Um, about a boy who likes wrestling, I believe, who runs away. He's got right. Down syndrome. He runs away from his sort of assistant living home or something like that. And he's sort of got a rural river guide. Yeah, and runs into – and they have like an inspirational story. I've only seen the trailer once. I have not seen right. the film. I saw the trailer once. It wasn't I said, at, I'm sorry. It was at South by okay. not Sundance. I saw the trailer and I went, wow, I will never think about this movie again. And it's done – Pretty well. 98% on Rotten Tomatoes, the highest grossing independent film of the year. Weird. Has outgrossed many studio releases. Yeah. That's all. Do you know a single person who has seen The Peanut Butter Falcon? No. Now, here's my thing. I must know a critic who saw it. I, well, don't, know. Yes. I don't know. But I've never had a conversation about, about it. And it's weird. I guess I don't, at some point, I guess I got to say, I guess Peanut Butter <laughs> Falcons get nominated for Best Picture this year. <laughs> but, best Peanut Butter. Right. But it premieres at South By. It doesn't win. I feel like people are like, Oh, a, a charming light film, right? Yeah. Roadside picks it up. I see the trailer. I go, oh, cool. That film's going to make $4,000, right? It's not like Shia LaBeouf yeah. is box office gold. But weirdly, Roadside Attractions has kind of cornered a market yeah. on selling indie to the Heartlands. Yeah, right, right, right. right. And I think they wisely recognized this is another mud Right. Mud, a much better film, I presume, a film I love. Mm-hmm. But that kind of surprise, out of the box success, where that was a movie that played at eight festivals, no one bought it, wasn't seen as commercial, and then did 20 million plus. Mm-hmm. And Roadside has also had more success selling faith based films yes. than most studios and studio arms. Yeah. Uh, so I think. Mud. Right. I, I think Peanut Butter Falcon is just not targeted to us. I think we're the coastal elites. We're the Thomas Waynes <laughs> in our ivory towers. So the jokers of the world are. Love the peanut butter falcon. I don't mean to slander. I know, I know. The peanut butter falcon. Need to cut it out with the uh, coastal elite stuff. We all know that the Joker's favorite movie is Joker. That is the only movie he would like. No, I'm sure Murray Franklin did like a Road Two movie or whatever, right? Like he did like a sort of Bob Hope movie at some point in his career. That's a funny idea, right? What if De Niro is like all the success of Joker? I love this character, Murray Franklin franchise. Off the success of Miami nomination for playing Robert Mueller in SNL, I will join the cast of SNL full time. Uh, we're going to use the de aging technology from the Irishman to make uh, the Young Adventures of Murray Franklin. Is it Murray Anderson? I don't fucking whatever. Know. No, it's Murray Franklin. I believe. Okay, I whatever. Know. Final thoughts. Don't like it. Best one of the year. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, no, I was like, I mean, I I was watching and I was like, I think this is a four for me. Sure. Yeah, I think stars. there are enough individual elements that I can respect, taken on their own, that I can't completely throw the movie out, but I don't think the movie in and of itself has any real weight or thought or value. I was kind of astonished by how little there there was. And as I was saying to you right before we recorded, I was like last night in my bathroom being like, I think I know what my final summation on this movie is going to be. Right. Having not seen it, and I watched the film and all of that was thrown out because I thought I was going to watch a film that was well-made and was dangerous in sort of its intent. Right, yeah. And instead I saw a movie that kind of is just shitting on the stage and throwing shit at the audience and going like, if you don't get this, you're a fucking square. And then just basically poking at all like truly scary people out there. And also saying this is art. You have to take this seriously. Yep. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, we were talking to producer Rachel, and she was like, how is it? Do I have to see it? And we were like, no. And she's like, is it what I think it is? And we're like, it's a movie that yells at you that it is what you think it is. (laughs) But it's not a very convincing argument. You know what's a better story that's like this? Read Franz Kafka's Metamorphosis. Uh, Yes. Metamorphosis. Watch Metamorphosis. Watch Taxi Driver. To watch Taxi Driver. Uh, You know what's a great work? We, We were talking about as we were walking in. Uh, Steven Sondheim's Assassins. The favorite musical of those three bros that Z- Joker killed on that subway train is a musical about presidential assassins. And it is very messy. 
It was controversial at the time. People thought they were glamorizing unsavory people. But it is a work that actually tries to grapple with the psychosis of people on the fringes of society. Love, love a sense. Uh, that is a master artist actually putting a lot of thought into what they are saying and the weight of what they are making because that's the whole thing. When Todd Phillips goes, oh, it's a heist movie, we're using the Joker as a shield to be able to get a $60 million drama made within the studio system. The thing he is not thinking about is the vehicle you are using to that end is a huge fucking franchise. It is a character that has yeah, exactly. a lot of cultural weight and a lot of cultural the messiness. most cultural weight. And as, yes. as one would say, with great power comes great responsibility. Right. And if you're going to fucking use the Joker to make your big movie, you kind of got to think about what you're saying. Now, Todd it. Phillips does not care about that. He doesn't, right? That's what I'm saying. It's not at all. I'm saying that's what – You a, saying that to Todd Phillips, I can just imagine the extent to which he would jerk off uh, of invisible course. penis. So rigorously, <laughs> uh, viciously. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not saying it to his face. I'm saying one should think about that. Yeah. And he doesn't. I don't know. That's the Joker. We're done with that. I, I don't know. I mean, it's like, do we ever cover a DC film again? No. That's yeah, my... I love that idea. Let's not do no, it anymore. I'm out. Uh, I actually took Birds of Prey, which looks, um, you know, at least like something. I think it looks off like Off the schedule. Yeah. Um, I'm done talking about these movies. I guess... Well, the real question is... That's the question. It's like Aquaman 2 and Aquaman Wonder Woman 2. Aquaman 2 and Wonder Woman 2 are sort of... And the, well, don't forget the... And we like James cool. Gunn. All right, so fine. Well, Let well, me clarify. We, we like James Gunn's tweets. Sorry, we don't have to me. set hard and fast rules for ourselves. But like Birds of Prey is one of those things where I'm like, that looks like um, uh, a pretty fun or somewhat competent movie. Like it's sort of that thing where I'm like, yeah, I don't know if I'm automatically like, you know, like that, that there's going to be – it's going to be so bananas that and we need to we talk about. what we found interesting was the shambling mass of DC it's trying to saying, make a was, cohesive thing. And that is gone. Right, right, For right. the better, probably. Right. If anything good comes out of the Joker, I hope it is that they green light like some fucking Elseworlds movies. That they let someone make like Superman Red Son or President the, Luther. What about Jokers? And there's many. I mean, you joke, but <sighs> that's probably gonna get pitched. My point <laughs> is what I don't wanna see is like I don't fucking know. I don't wanna see like Abel Ferrar's freeze. You know? Uh, hmm? With walking, maybe? That sounds good. Well, that sounds actually great. I don't <laughs> want right. to see the twisted version, but there are great standalone DC stories that could make good $60 million more high-end dramatic films. And it would be nice if the success of this movie encourages them to do that. I worry it will just be more empty provo uh, provocation. Yeah. Um, let's never speak of Joker again. I love that idea. Great. Um, Wrap it up. Wait a second. Are you telling me? Yeah, you're canceled. We're raising it to the rafters. <laughs> yes. Yeah! Oh my God. Woo! Retired Woo! bit. <laughs> it's up there. Ricky T. <laughs> so long. Goodbye. Sayonara, sucker. Thank you all for listening. Please remember to rate, review, subscribe. Thanks to Andrew Gooder for our social media. Liam Montgomery for our theme song. Pat Reynolds and Joe Bowen for our artwork. Uh, next week, Gemini Man. A very, very different movie. Lovely movie compared to this. Yeah. Very optimistic and sunshiny movie in a weird way. Uh, we got Ant-Man and the Wasp coming up on the old Patreon feed. Yeah, check special features. Well, uh, no, I think we have Whisper of the Heart first. Oh, we got Whisper of the Heart with yeah, our old friend Ramona yeah. Head. A legendary member. That just posted. So yeah, our, we will uh, have Ant-Man. Uh, trivia team, Walking Penis. Yeah. Uh, look, it all ties together. And then Ant-Man and the Wasp coming at the end of the month. No, yeah, we just posted that. So, right. Look forward to Ant-Man and the Wasp. Next week, Gemini Man, goodbye. Never oh, want to speak yeah. of Joker. Yeah. Did you guys just think, like, Joker's kind of like Trump? No, no, no. Enough. Oh, no, enough. Stop. No, okay. seriously, it's retired. But can I just say, to end our episode as we should, formally, uh, and as always, I'm still around. What? Remember me? No. Who are Richard you? T. Bate. Oh. Uh.